Hi everyone and welcome to Inside Unreal, a weekly show where we learn, explore and celebrate everything Unreal. I'm your host Victor Broden and with me today I have two amazing artists from our teams. Uh, let me introduce Matt Ostelay, technical hello. artist. I was going to say that before you said hello, but we didn't make that. And Jacob Kudel. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. We're live, boys. This is it. Um, today, we're going to talk a little bit about how you can optimize your environment in Unreal Engine. And uh, But to start off, I wanted to um, have both of you introduce yourself because it's the first time you're on the stream. And so why don't we start with Jacob? Yeah. Hi. So uh, my name is Jacob and I'm here as an environment artist for Quixel at Epic Games. That's my job. Um, yeah. That's pretty much it. Very short and concise. <laughs> That's good. Matt's turn. And I'm Matt Osley, as Victor said. I'm a technical artist, uh, developer relations specifically. So my job is working with all of our licensees, which is a lot of fun. Uh, I've been working in the video games industry for like 10 years. And like the common thread through just about every project I've ever worked on is performance and optimization. And that's why I'm so excited to be on the live stream to talk about performance it's your time to shine I'm with that so said so yeah please go ahead matt the floor is yours so uh a couple of things to get started um you know we're this is not talking about like mobile performance or vr hardware um, but a lot of the stuff we're going to be talking about is broadly applicable we're really focused on like deferred rendering current gen pipelines um and like, yeah, of course, there's the fewer triangles, you know, cheaper shaders, all that fun stuff. But there, that's the only part of the story. And this kind of assumes that you are um, intelligently uh, building your environments. You're not, you don't have, you know, fifty bajillion triangles in your in your rocks or anything like that. Um, and we're not going to talk about like quality sliders or anything like that. This is like we're going to optimize for your high end. Um, Oh, and before we get started, I should note that I'm running on like a 2080 RTX, big beefy processor, big RAM. So I'm, you know, this is some of the stuff is going to be, it's going to look like it's running really quickly, but we can get it running a little faster. Um, but the thing about performance is that a lot of this conversation has to happen in context. Not every game or project is going to have the same problems for performance. It's going to vary from project to project, how you set up your project, how you've constructed your environments. Um, which is why I'm so excited that I got to work with Jacob at Quixel and he, he was working on this scene. So Jacob, why don't you tell us uh, about the scene that we're working on today? Yeah, so uh, this is a scene that is currently in development. This is not released yet. It will be released. Um, it's essentially a, a medieval scene and we're planning to have this actually be a game because the the entire thing with the demo projects or projects that uh, Quixel has released so far uh, we always uh, strive for VFX quality uh, graphics inside of Unreal Engine um, and even with uh, Rebirth with uh, which had sections that ran absolutely fine in real time um, it wasn't actually on peak performance with you being able to to walk through um, and so since we've joined Epic, uh, our focus sort of shifted a little bit to A, providing you these demo scenes so that you're able to dive in and uh, sort of see and uh, dissect how we do things, um, but also understand how things are done. And up until now, we've never really hit on how do you create a game or how do you make things run in a game? We've always just demonstrated visuals, but never actually proven our point of, yeah, this actually runs in real time on current gen hardware. Uh, so with this project, we actually want to prove ourselves and demonstrate to um, uh, our customers and Apex customers um, that this is something that is absolutely possible, even with a super small and condensed team. Um, and so me being just an artist, so super quick background, I'm, um, I sort of dropped out of university super quickly into Quixel. Um, and my entire focus with Unreal Engine has always been just cinematic shots, so just pure visuals. I never worked as a game artist. Um, so now with this project especially, I'm sort of out of my depth, uh, considering what we want to hit on visually um, and what, we, what steps we actually need uh, to take to make this run smoothly. Um, and so, so this is where Matt jumps in with, with his knowledge uh, and advises us on how to build systems, uh, what systems are smarter uh, ways to approach things uh, compared to maybe vanilla setups or just brute forcing things 
Um, and this is why we have this dream in the sort of perfect context of this project, um, because performance optimization, as Matt stated, is something that continues throughout the, uh, the process of a project. Um, and it wouldn't make sense to show you a finished scene and just talk about, hey, yeah, this is these are the steps that we took to optimize the scene, but rather we dive in now where everything is um, not really finished at all um, and show you what steps we're taking in this moment and continuously throughout the project to sort of get the best uh, out of the engine and out of this project. Hope this oh. makes sense. Yeah, I that works for me. So the so one of the things that when when I first pitched this to uh, Galen and Jacob and Victor was that uh, this was you know we'd started talking about this a while back. Um, I started I got into the project on the earlier side, so I got to do the thing that I think is the most important for for performance optimization across the board, and that is I got to set up my perf metrics early um, because if you are checking. If you were checking your performance early and often, you know when you've added something that affects performance. I'll give you a great example. I was working on a project many, many years ago, and our QA department every day had cameras set up throughout the map, and they would go to each camera. Um, we had console command, so it was you know the exact same camera every time, exact same transforms, same hardware, um, and it would they would take like a two or three second average of the the frame time and then they add that into a report and so for any given map it might have had 20 cameras because they were they were pretty large and i remember there was this one cave that for the longest time had been running at six milliseconds nine milliseconds we were targeting um 60 frames per second 16.66 milliseconds so everything was going great and then one day suddenly it shot up to like 25 milliseconds and because I knew that the day before it had been running at nine milliseconds, I knew that some I, that there was a specific camera that was causing issues, and I could go to that camera in my build, run a pix capture on it, which is a, a GPU profiler, and dive into the draw calls and figure out what was going on. And it turned out that there was a a distortion texture that was like twenty eighty by twenty eighty, and this was on the Xbox One, and so it was a, it was a really heavy texture with a really heavy shader on it, and it was full screen, so affecting every pixel on the screen. And so because we had been checking performance every single day for every single camera, we knew that uh, we knew something was was wrong and we could immediately react to it. Um, and so that's that kind of leads into the other thing is you have to, how you set up your project is going to be different. So we're working with a first person camera, um, you know, so I always know that the camera is going to be right right down at eye level for the most part. We're not going to be way up in the sky looking down on all of the all of the trees way out in the distance. I know for the most part that we're going to be down here and super contained. Um, the other thing is is making sure that that when you are deciding on your perf metrics, you are being consistent about it. Um, so like I said, I know that every time I profile this project, I'm going to be launching the executable. I have a, a blueprint that goes through and does the profiling for me, and I'll show that in a second. And I know that I'm going to be targeting, let's say, you know, 20 milliseconds or something like that. As long as you're consistent and as long as you're focused on the same things every day, then you you know if any changes you've made have have been for the better or or to the detriment of your your performance. The other thing that I think is really important when we talk about performance, so I'm going to go into my console commands, hit stat FPS, so we can talk about this. So there are two numbers when you do stat FPS. There is the frames per second and the milliseconds. And when we talk about it, you know, colloquially, we'll talk about frames per second. We want to hit 30 frames. We want to hit 60 frames or something like that. But I think more important, um, because the difference between 20 frames per second and 30 frames per second is 10 milliseconds. But the difference between 30, mil 30 frames per second and 60 frames per second is 20 milliseconds. But the difference between 60 frames per second and 75 frames per second is like 5 milliseconds. And so trying, you know, saying that, oh, this change we made got us 50 frames back or, or 20 frames back, that number means different things because the number, the, the amount of time it takes to calculate that frame changes. 
So I like to talk about performance in terms of milliseconds because this number is a straight line. So if I if I look at something and I say, hey, this is going to save us two milliseconds or this costs us two milliseconds, that's always going to be two milliseconds, whether that's the difference between 20 frames per second and 25 frames per second is variable. So I, I can always say, I can always look at milliseconds. And I know that's just sort of true. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that performance is a is not a is not a menu. I don't think of performance as a menu like, oh yes, we can have 10 characters and then we have to stop. Um, perf is a pie chart. And so if, and it's a reflection of your values. So maybe you're working on a game and you, you know that you really only need a few thousand triangles to represent your entire environment because you're going to spend a bunch of time with your lighting or your post-processing. And that's a decision for you to make. So in this context, that's again why I like talking about this scene in context, in this context, we know that we want to focus on the environment. We want to highlight the quality of Quixel's assets, which is very high. Um, and so we're going to be focused on, on the environment and, and showcasing the environment assets. So that means, yeah, our triangle count's going to be, be really, really high. Um, and maybe we can make up for that somewhere else that doesn't affect performance. The other thing I really want to talk about is like, I am not really going to be doing anything today that is that is so drastic as like, you know, we're going to take all of our textures and we're going to down res them to 1024s. I'm not going to rip out instructions out of a material. I'm not going to reduce the triangle count of anything um, because I want to maintain visual quality for as long as humanly possible. If you get to the point of, of like, man, we tried everything, every single thing, and we just can't get the triangle or we can't, just can't get the frame times we need, maybe it's time to look into triangle reduction. Maybe not, but I think for the most part, we can get there without it, especially in this scene. Um, the other thing to keep in mind as you're looking at performance is, is the amount of effort you are putting in versus the number of pixels that are affected. Because the thing, one of the big things about performance is that if, you know, if I can make an optimization to a post-process material that saves me, you know, uh, that saves one instruction, that's one instruction. I don't have to run for every single pixel on the screen. But if I have one unique asset that's like this rock off in the corner, I'm not going to focus on making this the most truly optimized I possibly can because it's only right there and it's only there one time. Um, so let's take a look at this scene. Actually, let's, let's run some perf. Let's do that. So I have set up a blueprint and this blueprint has a bunch of perf cameras in it. And uh, what it'll do is it'll go through launch real quick. Um, this blueprint will go through the scene. It will um, move from camera to camera to camera. It will run a, a GPU trace using Unreal Insights. And we'll go back and look at that trace. And then we can get the average of the frame time uh, for each of those cameras. And I'll show you what that looks like when this builds. And Matt, can you explain now why you're picking launch rather than play an editor? Yes. So uh, again, this goes back to the consistency question. Um, as long as you are, I like to compare apples to apples. So if I'm, um, if I want to make sure that the scene is running at frame rate, I know that I'm going to launch it through um, through Unreal as opposed to play an editor because there's there's a little bit of overhead when you're running the editor. So if I want like a a, a ground truth, if you will, of performance, I'm going to look at it here. Um, and the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to full screen that. So I have a blueprint set up in this scene. And again, this is a sample scene that will be released at a later date. So this blueprint is going to be in there too, if you want to take a look. And I can just do a ke star start perf. And ke star is just going to call the custom event start perf on all of the blueprints that have that custom event in the scene. There's only one. So I can hit this and we can go and we can take a look at this. So I've got that stat FPS up in the corner. I'm running an Unreal Trace. I'm doing or an Unreal Insights Trace on the GPU, and I'm gathering a screenshot. And the other cool thing is that because I have all these screenshots, if I wanted to go back and do like a little GIF of a progress GIF, it's built in. I get that for free from doing this. And so we can see like, hey, we're running 43 milliseconds for the most part, and we're done. So I only have about eight cameras. So now that I'm done with that, I'm going to Alt F4 out of there. And that's going to finish running. 
and I'm going to have Unreal Insights. So uh, Unreal Insights is a thing that ships with uh, UE425. We've made some improvements in 426 that are super, super cool, and I'll go into that in a second. Um, I because we're we're running off of uh, running off of GitHub. I've built this through Visual Studios, and we've got instructions for that on our website. So when Unreal, when you run a trace, it will output a excuse me, it'll output a trace file. I'm going to go. I'm going to open that file because I know where it is. Live stream saved staged builds. Windows editor medieval village saved. Where'd that go? There we go. Okay. Is that my perf? That's not my perf. Where did it go? Oh, no. We can mention, if you're curious about how Matt is using Unreal Insights here, um, there's plenty of documentation out there. There is documentation on how to use Unreal Insights um, to sort of gather the trace and use it, uh, exactly what Matt's doing right now. Yep. So I cannot find the trace file from that session. That's OK because I have backups. Very smart thing to have. Yes. It's been cooking all night, right? Oh, yep. All right, so I'm going to grab this one. And it, this, looks, this looks like a lot, right? I'm not too worried about it. So this is going to show you every, this is the, the big full trace. This is every single, um, every single trace, every single thread, every single call. But we're focused right up here on the GPU. And what, what I did in my, um, in my blueprint is I call trace.start and trace.stop. And that means I can look at this and go, all right, this was camera one, this was camera two, this was camera three, camera four, and so on. And what I can do is I can show all columns, view column, average inclusive time. And if I highlight this little section here, Collapse GPU. I can look over here and see the GPU. So the average for that was 48.64 milliseconds on camera one. I can look over at camera two, collapse that. Again, 60.59 milliseconds. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Right, so 48.9. So I can see that it, you know, each of these frames took took a little bit of time to render. Um, and I can I can keep that in mind. And I can even dive in and I can see, all right, so the pre-pass was three milliseconds, shadow depths was was whatever, 13.2 milliseconds. And, and this gives me an idea. This gives me a place to look. And it also gives me uh, metrics to which I can I can compare. And I can I can go back tomorrow after we make these changes and I can run this test again and we can see whether or not that was that was um, a net gain or or a detriment to perf. And we and these things match up with after we open the map here. Um, but those numbers will match up with the numbers that we see in the editor. And I can show you, ooh, ha, I knew this was going to happen. All right, so we're going to close that. Welcome we're to the club, Matt. Yeah, it's, uh, we're, uh, you know, we're doing it live. We're doing it live. Yep. That's not the first time. It's not going to be the last. In the meantime, um, mind answering. Oh, actually, that's loading pretty quick. You know what? You're going to be up and running here. And... Yeah. I also I also got to open the map, so I'll take a question. All right, all right, all right. Let me get the right doc here. Um, let's see. There was one that was related. Oh, we did get the question again. If the demo scene will be available for download, I think it's worth repeating uh, that yes. ultimately this yes. is an example scene that will be available for free for download. Um, using both Megascans assets and some other assets that are permanently free on the marketplace. Yep. Let's see. Yeah. Still. So. That's the... that's I think my my favorite part about this project is that is yes. that once we're done, all of this is going to be freely available. Yeah, it's it's essentially going to be a, a huge learning opportunity uh, for people to just really dive into and dissect everything that's going on in the uh, in the scene. And there's. There's a bunch of cool tech in there. Uh, so we're, we're talking, I mean, obviously your your uh, performance blueprints, we have volumetric clouds, we have in-engine created assets in there. So is it, this scene, uh, it's going to be fun to dive into. I'm, you know, I'm partial to the landscape material. I think it's really cool. 
Oh, the, the landscape material is the best. I mean, Matt did it. But that's that's a different live stream. All right, so we're so we're back, and so so all of those numbers we saw in Unreal Insights map to the numbers that we see when we run the console command stat GPU. Right. So I see, you know, here's my total, here's my shadow depths, here's my base pass. But you'll notice that the average here is only 30.5 milliseconds, and we were seeing 40 milliseconds. Well, Matt, what was going on there? Well, I'm rendering a much smaller frame. And that's why I think it's so, 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 so important that when you're measuring performance, you are consistent. I know that I'm rendering at 1920 by 1200. Those are my numbers. And so if I go to compare the shadow depths value in this shot to something that I was seeing in one of my perf cameras, it's, it's not, I'm not comparing apples to apples and, and the numbers won't match up. Now, if I make a change here and I don't move my camera at all, then I can see how it changes. So the other thing to keep in mind, there are a number of commands to look at. Like I said, you know, we're, we're focused on basically in stat GPU. We'll turn that off. But the other things are like, you know, we got stat game, right? I can see what my world tick time is. I can see all the transforms and all that fun stuff. Um, I've got stat RHI, and we'll talk a little bit more about this, but this shows me the draw primitives, it shows me the triangle counts, it shows me the memory load of everything. Um, stat render thread commands. There are, there are a lot of different places to look for perf. So the F draw scene command, you'll notice that this number looks really close to the one that we see in stat GPU. That's what that is. Um, and so what I like to do when I'm, when I'm, when I see performance, oh, now let's talk about the blueprint first. So I have a, I have a sub level called performance and that has all of my perf cams in it. Why are you going to do me like that? That has all of my perf cameras in it. I'm searching and... for the uh, sub level. Oh no, I'm, I'm searching for the folder to just show all of it. There we go. And these are just camera actors, and I really, I really use them for, um, I really use them for for placement and piloting, and their transforms, and they all have a actor tag, uh, do, 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 an actor tag which is perfcam, and I have a blueprint called BP Perf Analysis. Let's take a look at that real quick. Drag that onto the screen. So on not construct, on begin play, it goes through and it gets all actors of tag perf cam. And I'm only doing this once, so I'm not worried about this. The thing to keep in mind is that the order of this is not necessarily deterministic. So what might be called in the editor camera actor two, and it should be the first camera in my mind, that might end up in a different order for various CPU reasons. Um, so I have a sort perf cams by name. I will probably optimize this, but for our current purposes, um, uh, for our current purposes, I get the number from the end of the camera's actor name, and I bubble sort. And it's not, you know, it's not the most cool, but it does give me a deterministic order. Um, and when I go to release the game, this is probably, you know, quote unquote, release the game. I wouldn't be including all of my perf stuff. This would all be hidden in debug. Um, and then start perf is that console command we called earlier. Um, ke star start perf calls this function, runs stat FPS, starts set, sets my index to zero, and we're off to the races. And it will grab that index. It will get the camera at that index in the array, move the camera to it, and run start trace GPU. So we know that we're starting a GPU trace on that. Wait two seconds, stop, take a screenshot, let us know that it happened wait a little bit longer for the camera to settle out. Because um, sometimes if you call shot and then you immediately move on, you might get like a blurry frame. We don't want that because then we don't know what we saw. Um, and then it, if, we're, um, if we're supposed to keep going, because I've also set this up to work on a single camera, um, if we're supposed to keep going, make sure that we're not at the end and it'll either continue or it'll stop. And all of these are console commands that I can call so I can call set cam. So maybe I was looking at my perf data and I saw that camera one or camera index one, AKA camera two was at like 60 frames per second. So what I can do 
So I can hit play. Because I want to go to that camera and I want to I want to take a look at some of the issues that it's having. So I will KE star set cam two. Haha, I've already I've already off by one myself. KE star set cam one. All right. So this was this was a shot that I noticed was particularly heavy. I should also note, in Jacob's defense, I have turned some things off, optimizations that he had already done. Um no, 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 no. The, the, the number the numbers you see here are are <laughs> staged. So I can look at this, I can look at stat GPU, and I start my like Dr. House level of differential diagnosis. I look at the, the highest number, and I see that the highest number we're seeing is shadow depth. And this is this is gonna be a lot of fun. So shadow depth is basically rendering rendering all of our dynamic shadows. And we have a lot of dynamic shadows. And I run, I see this a lot where um, the, the questions may either be, hey, my shadows disappear after a certain distance, or you know, I'm trying, the shadows really close to the camera are, are super, super um, blurry. What do I do? And this all falls under the realm of cascading shadow maps. Uh, and these are, it's basically we are we are rendering from us from the camera forward different shadow maps, and these are um, you know they might be 1024, 2048, or something like that, and they cascade out to a certain distance, and in, and the system has a way to break up. You know the first cascade is X units away, and it all fits into the dynamic shadow distance. So now that I know that my shadow depths are super super high, I'll stop playing. And I'll go look at the directional light. Directional light. So I know that the cast. This is going to be casting shadows. It's movable. I know that it's casting shadows because it's you know that's our sunlight, and it should be casting shadows. So there's a couple of things that are happening here. The dynamic shadow distance is thirty thousand units. That means we are running dynamic shadows all the way out to thirty thousand units away from us. 30,000 units away from the camera. And that is really, really far, right? That's, you know, from here, gosh, what is, what is this asset at? This asset is 920 by that, way out into the distance, grab cube for distance, right? So this cube isn't even 30,000 units away from our main level. So we're rendering dynamic shadows all the way out here. Well, that's scary. Which, hey, maybe we don't need to do that. And again, this is, you know, the focus of here is let's try to improve performance without sacrificing visual quality. And since I know that we're not really going to be seeing dynamic shadows out to that distance, I can bring that number in. So I'm going to leave stat GPU on. And we're going to go down to our camera. Because again, we want to compare apples to apples. All right, I'm not going to move my camera from here so we can see these numbers change. So I'll come down here and I'll say, let's move the dynamic shadow distance into like 15,000 units. And we see that number start creeping down. OK, so that, that saved me four milliseconds. And I don't notice a difference. Four milliseconds number, can be a big deal. Right? That can, that can be make or break. No, we got to keep going. We're not done yet. Um, so the number, I, in my experience, your mileage may vary. In my experience, the number of cascades has a bigger effect on performance than the size of the cascades or the distance. So if I crank this up to 10, because what, again, this goes back to how many operations are you doing over and over and over again? And if we are doing 10 shadow cascades every single frame, that's going to cost a lot. But if we're doing one shadow cascade with a higher resolution, that might be cheaper. So 10 shadow cascades cost us that we went from 16 to 23. That's eight milliseconds. If you're targeting, a, if you're targeting a 60 frame per second game, that's half of your, your draw budget. And we haven't even started talking about characters and we haven't even started talking about um, particle effects or anything like that. All the dynamic stuff that happens. And that's another thing that I should have mentioned at the top. I like to, when we're talking about environment, I like to keep my number like a few milliseconds lower 
than the overall target for the game. So if I'm targeting a game that's running at 30 frames per second, that's 33 milliseconds, my environment target might be 25, 27 and a half milliseconds. Again, it depends on, you know, do I know if I'm going to have a thousand characters on screen or if I'm only going to have five. And these are, these are value judgments you have to make for yourself. So let's say I'm only going to need one cascade. And we can watch that number drop. Oh, wow. Okay, so in, with two value changes just on the directional light, we've gone, from, we've gone from 20 milliseconds to 11 milliseconds. I haven't changed the camera, so I know that these numbers are relatively correct to each other. So the other thing you can do, maybe you do want shadows that extend beyond 15,000 units, and that's where distance field shadows come into play. Now keep in mind, distance um, when you generate distance fields for your meshes, that is a project setting, and that has to happen for all of your static meshes. Um, so there will be an additional memory load there, but we're now we're now going to be calculating shadows against the static, uh, the static distance fields, autosave of course, um, and those are a little cheaper to calculate. And so the distance field shadow will basically, this distance will cover everything from the end of your dynamic shadows up to this distance. And then beyond that will be the far cascade. And effectively, the far cascade is an opt-in shadow cascade. It is, you know, if I have a giant pillar that I need to be casting a shadow across the entire map, but the giant pillar is a bajillion units away. I might opt that into the far cascade and nothing else and work with that. And so the far cascade settings are down here. But again, for our purposes, we don't really need a far cascade. We can cover all of our shadows within, say, you know, one with one cascade at 15,000 units. Um, and it looks like distance field shadows didn't have a huge effect on our perf, positive or negative, which is great. I just turn that. All right, so that that was eight milliseconds right there. Everything's going great, and you know there's probably going to be a little overhead here too for the GPU because I'm streaming off of this computer. Uh, my GPU is also doing a bunch of work to do that, so that's something to keep in mind too. Okay, so let's uh, let's move on from that because the next thing I notice is that my base pass and my pre pass are really high, and. This this is where you know we talk about this is your number of draw calls this is your number your triangle counts these are your um, your shaders that's where all of this is coming from so let's take a look at that so what do I mean by a a, a draw call you can think of a draw call as the same geometry with the same material and the reason I say geometry is because vertex colors are part of geometry so that means if you have if you have two rocks and they are the same static mesh asset, but you have applied different vertex paints to them, they are different draw calls. If you have, um, and this is all within the same like static mesh actor, and we have added uh, dynamic mesh instancing, um, which is super, super useful. That was added in 422, and that gives us the ability to, it tells the, the CPU to intelligently group draw calls together. And the easiest way you can expect that, inspect that, is with stat RHI, uh, render hardware interface for those interested. And again, this shows us our draw calls. So draw primitive calls, almost 14,000. That's a lot. Um, my advice is usually if you're targeting something like the Xbox One, that should be maybe 2,000. Higher end, you know, maybe you, you have a bunch of stuff in, in a different uh, quality setting. Uh, maybe you can go up a little higher. So on my machine, and I can, I can process a lot of assets, right? Um, but we can see what happens if we do r.mesh draw commands dot dynamic instancing. And we just set this to zero. So watch that draw primitive call. So dynamic mesh instancing saves us almost 11,000 draw calls, which is huge. Um, and it may be more huge. It may be. It may have more of effect an effect on GPU performance on lower end hardware. Again, I'm running. I'm running beefy, beefy hardware. What are you running, Matt? 
I am running a 2080 RTX. I've got 128 gigabytes of RAM, and I've got some monstrous server processor. Um, this is this is a very very powerful machine, and I'm glad to have it because uh, I do you know for some of our licensees, I'll be I'll be answering ray tracing questions, or I will be working on a very very heavy scene, and it's really nice to have that that horsepower. Um, okay, so I know that in my base pass. Right, so in this shot, base pass is four milliseconds, shadow depth is nine milliseconds. So one of the things that um, I can do to reduce the number of draw calls is we have to think about occlusion and, and how the draw thread prepares all of the data for the, um, for the GPU. So the first thing it does is it looks at everything's call distance. So every actor has a max draw distance. So I'll go grab, you know, I'll go grab that. And I can go, I can go here. Max draw distance. And I can say, you know, so this is set at zero, which means that as far away as I could possibly get from this thing, 50 bajillion units, right? This draw distance is going to be zero. And zero means don't worry about it, which means we're always going to be drawing it. And that's not necessarily a good thing, um, especially the further and further away you get. Because one of the Big things about um, one of the big things about GPU performance is as as the size of the triangles get smaller and smaller and smaller, the uh, more expensive it gets for the GPU to render them. So if you have a a triangle that is smaller than a single pixel, the GPU is actually rendering. Let me see if I get this right. It's effectively rendering four pixels around that triangle, and it has to. And if you have like four sub pixel triangles all next to each other, it's now having to render those same pixels 16 times, which is super, it's super expensive. Again, the more operations we do all at once, the more expensive it's going to be. So the things that I can do to reduce the number of draw calls, right off the hop, I can set max draw distances. I can set max draw distances. I can set that really easily. Uh, and I can do that with call distance volumes. So that's just under place actor, call distance volume. I can drag that into the world. And what this does is it gives me options for sizes. And this size, keep in mind, is the, the largest single dimension of the bounding box. So if you have an asset that is like 10 units tall by 10 units wide by 1,000 units long, that's going to be cut, that's going to be hit by anything that is um, 1,000 units. Uh, if I have something that is 50 by 50 by 50, that's 50. So maybe I'll say, you know, everything that is 200, oops, that is 50 units, I want to start calling that at 1,000 units. I'm going to make that uh, call distance volume super, super big. Right, so I'm going to make that 15,000 units because that's basically the size of my map. And you can have a bunch of these in your level, and these will be um, basically anything within this volume will be affected by the call distances. And so maybe I want to start calling out stuff that is 50 units after 1,000 a thousand units. And maybe I want to start calling stuff out that is 200 units or larger after mm, 2,000 units. And this, this is all, again, this is all going to be a value judgment for you. I should also note that it only works, um, this will only affect in the, if you have game view enabled. And it looks like we've called out a bunch of our trees already. Oh, so that's good to keep in mind. Um, so if you have game view enabled. It looks like yeah. it affected pretty much the, the entire foliage there too. Right. So, so I think that's because we have the size zero called distance zero. So I'm going to make that. I'm going to make that 500 units. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> the trees are back. Perfect. Um, so maybe I want to start calling everything that is bigger than 500 units at 5,000 units away from the camera. Aha. Nope. Maybe I want that to be 15,000 units away from the camera, or 20,000 units away. Or maybe I want everything that's bigger than 500 units to never call. And that's what I think I'll do for now. 
So again, so I've moved my camera around, so this number's not going to be um, perfectly accurate, right? All right, so with that, that's at 13,000 units. If I set that to zero, so that was a thousand draw calls. And we're looking at the frame and I didn't see anything change. Did you see anything change, Jacob? No, not really. <laughs> right? So maybe, yeah. so yeah, let's say I leave that at, at 2,000 units. Shoot, that's a thousand draw calls right there. Hey, maybe that's half your budget. Great. Um, so that's that's one quick technique to reduce the number of draw calls. And I'll show you with our good pal render doc um, why that can get super, super scary. So I have over here on the other screen, render doc. Um, this may look scary, but I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, so currently, uh, I'm having a little bit of trouble making the packaged build. Uh, obviously, we will have this fixed before we release the uh, the full sample. But when I do the launch, it will make an executable in saved stage builds. So I know I can launch that. And I'm going to say, hey, open, you know, when I hit launch, open the map Medieval Village blockout. And while we're at it, just enable uh, Unreal Insights with a GPU trace. I'm not going to launch that. I already have a capture. Oh, big, big, big important note. If you were launching, if you were launching with um, render doc tracing kind of attached to the process, make sure you have capture child processes enabled. Uh, the other thing is if, if you are targeting DirectX 12 hardware, make sure that you have developer mode turned on in your window settings. Otherwise, none of these things will show up. So what we can see here is all of the commands that got sent to the GPU to draw the frame. Um, so this is after call distances have been checked. This is after uh, frustum calling has has been done. Uh, and I can talk about that in a second. But we can go in here and we can look at base pass. And this will show us all the stuff that happened in the base pass. And I can see the straw material drew the static mesh SM card test 11 times, 11 instances. This is the dynamic mesh instancing happening all at once. Scene color deferred. I'm going to over, overlay with wireframe mesh. We're going to scroll down, and we can see all of our stuff start to show up in our different buffers. Maybe I'll do try. And as we go, as we go further down the command list, more stuff is getting added. Oops, we're slowing down. Oh no! Oh no! We're doing all right. We're doing all right. But this is really the beautiful thing, because for, for me as a sort of just purely visual artist who never really needed to, quote unquote, worry about performance, uh, because my real time was sequence of real time compared to actual real time, mm -hmm. um, this insight, even for me who works now at, uh, at Epic Games, is super valuable and seeing how you can actually de deconstruct <laughs> what your scene is doing. And of course, it's... It crashed. Right. Too um, many triangles. <laughs> this Correct. is super, super important and super valuable uh, to sort of get a breakdown of the tools uh, that are available and how to how to use them to their full potential. So the the one of the notes that I would like to make right off the hop is um, when you are attaching uh, profiling tools to uh, to your game or to your editor or something like that. There's going to be a bit of overhead um, because this is basically uh, when we attach the process, we're we're basically saying, hey, you know, I want the verbose log of all the render commands, and that's going to take a little bit of extra time to calculate. So, in some situations, it it may not be too bad. In some situations, it may be uh, many, 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 many extra milliseconds spread across each of your draw calls. So, all right, let's jump back in here. So right, I see there are many, 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 many draw calls. And that's OK, because we're going we're gonna to start getting them down. But what I wanted to show you very, very briefly in here is, let's go all the way to the end. Let's maybe look at that. And let's look at triangle size. Oh, it does not want to look at triangle size. 
<laughs> That's okay. We can do this over here. So we can see this in the quad overdraw optimization view mode. So what this is showing us. All right, sorry about that, everyone. Quick little audio interface crash. <laughs> if you watch the stream, it has happened. <laughs> I'm still waiting on my new interface. Uh, it's difficult now in the pandemic times to get the kind of hardware you need, but we are back and uh, Matt's ready to show you everything about overdraw the emails. We're back. Okay, so we're going to talk about quad overdraw. So uh, back in the days of forward ren rendering, when we had to render basically everything from back to front, um, where you know if you had a if you had a, a giant fog plane that would have to render on top of you know everything behind it, you'd have to run the pixel shader over and over and over again. And there's certainly still some of that, right? This is our one of our fog particle effects, and we can see that that's causing a lot of overdraw. But what this view shows you is the number of times each pixel is getting rendered. And we can see that, you know, in a lot of situations, each pixel is getting rendered four times, right? And what this is, is small triangles. Um, and one of the best ways you can bat that with is with LODs. And what I love, love, love about Unreal is that, you know, back in the day, I had to think about you know, making sure that all of my LODs were, were perfectly set up. Of course, with Quixel, you get LODs for everything right out of the box, right out of Quixel. But maybe you are working on a custom asset and you are, you are um, building something yourself and you don't, you don't have, you haven't thought to make LODs or maybe you just want to make sure if LODs do affect or do improve your performance, um, you can generate them automatically in Unreal. This is... I think, I think one it, of my favorite things. It, I think it is one of the sorry for for sort of no, jump, no, go ahead. but I I think it is genuinely one of the most overlooked core features that will help you deal with pretty much any asset, whether it's a mega scans asset uh, and you bring in high poly data for a uh, cinematic, but you want to still crunch that down a bit. Um, the the automated uh, lot setup and the, uh, the reduction setting, so the the non-destructive reduction power of the static mesh editor, is insanely useful. It is mm, brilliant, and so many people don't really either know about it, uh, especially when they when they start getting into Unreal Engine, um, mm -hmm. or they they just don't use it. But you should use that every single time you you get the chance to. Yes. This, can single-handedly um, get your quad overdraw from, let's say, uh, four times or even uh, seven times drawn um, per triangle to easily down to two or one mm -hmm. without so, any fuss of creating manual LODs and importing all of that. Right. And maybe, you know, maybe for your hero assets, maybe for some assets that are more important, or maybe for various computational algorithmic reasons, um, your your LODs aren't up to your level of quality. You can always import your own, or maybe you import your LOD one, but not your LOD two. But it's as simple. It is truly as simple as setting the number of LODs, and this will automatically, you know, if you have one LOD, so it's LOD zero, uh, and you want another one, you turn that number to two, and we're going to spend a little time, and we're going to spin up, boom, another LOD for you. And all of those reduction settings are right here. You know, percent triangles is going to be you know, percent triangles at the last level and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, and these are all, back in the day, it used to be distance-based. Nowadays, it's screen size-based. So based on how big that thing is on the screen, how many, um, you know, which LOD are we going to pick? So up in the corner, I can see all the way back here, this is LOD 6. Its screen size is 0.17. And now it's only 40 triangles. And that's great because I wouldn't want to render this triangle this far away so we can see that looks solid um i only want to render 40 triangles i don't want to render all of them because that's not detail you can see and i think that's one of the things i i've heard before um that oh but this is going to reduce my quality well do you see that from that distance not really I mean, the, huh. the quality reduction is something that or the, the supposed quality reduction is something that I was afraid of starting out 
Mm -hmm. uh, but especially my workflow when when I bring in assets uh, is I usually just bring in uh, the the Megascan slot zero, which is a very high resolution mesh. Like it is it is up there. Um, and then just in the editor, I start bringing down the the reduction settings from the original 100% triangles down to 50, down to 35% of the original triangle count, and you really don't see any difference unless you start rendering out in 4k or 6k or do burnouts in 6k to to render right. it down at which point you are rendering at a higher resolution and yes you may see that detail and then suddenly that is not a sub pixel triangle right yes exactly so one of the things i hear one of the concerns i hear is oh matt you know the 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 number of lod's that setting is not exposed to the bulk property editor. And you're right, it's not. But you know what it is? LOD group. So LOD groups are also super useful. These are pre-built settings for all of the different LODs uh, for how you want to set up your LODs for different settings. So a large prop, a small prop, a Vista asset, an architecture asset, all of these are built into the editor um, and either I have shared those documents in the forum post for this or I will after the live stream. Um, and these set these numbers automatically. So a fully adjust set may have eight LODs, a small prop may have two LODs or four LODs. That, so if I go select all these assets, right click, asset actions, bulk edit via property matrix, it's right there. And I can select all of these and I can just type small prop. Or I might go, I might select those three assets and go to lot settings. And I might type small prop over here. And now it's going to go through. Now everything is going to be set up to small prop. And now all of the, and it generated all of the LODs for it. And it did all of the other reduction settings. And it did the auto screen size settings. And it took 30 seconds. Yes, that um, is the, the big point with the sort of in-engine lot crunching and, mm -hmm. and just uh poly count reduction settings mm -hmm. is they're incredibly fast um it is it it really takes i mean you, you've seen it changing three relatively high quality assets um to to completely shuffle their settings around what was that a second to two seconds of actual computation time mm -hmm. um it's so quick and it's a, an absolute non-hassle uh to work that way yes. uh, and optimize assets that way right so that's that's huge. LODs are huge. Um, and again, right, we're the thing that I want to focus on is rendering the detail that we can actually see. Because so much of our frame time is probably spent rendering detail that we can't see. And and that's kind of that's kind of the 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 crux of 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 this is I want to render the details that we can actually see. Speaking of details we can actually see, I, I made a little test map. I want to show you guys this test map. Um, so uh, one of the things you can do, yeah, I'm going to save those. Um, one of the things that you can do with your landscape material that I have a lot of fun doing is using landscape grass types. And landscape grass types basically say, if you know I sampled this layer, say grass, put grass fully, put this foliage asset where I tell you to. Did it not do it? Oh, it didn't save right. Oh, no. Mm -hmm. We're doing it live. Foliage enabled. OK. Find parent. Oh, maybe it's thinking. Computers have emotions too, you know? It's true. I love my computer. I hope it's doing well. You, you need to hold them very dear and talk sweetly to them. Mm -hmm. This is the same this. way you should talk to your plants. <laughs> yep. My plants are very important to me. Almost. Oh, yeah, I think it's thinking. I mean, your fans and your power supply, they, they like carbon dioxide just like your plants, right? <laughs> you know, someone back in school told me that. I'm sure it's still true. Definitely. Everything, you know, I got a, I got a gas generator running this computer right now. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, did did we mention the storms outside? I was just about to ask how the how it's looking on your end. We uh, I don't think we mentioned that <laughs> the trees are <laughs> mm, going way back and forth there on the east coast here, yeah. close to Raleigh. Yeah. They're coming in. Okay, it's happening. All right, so oh, yes. ah, ha, ha, there it goes. Perfect. Brilliant. That's what I'm looking for. So Brilliant. one of the thi- right. So one of the things that I set up on uh, this landscape material is different foliage types, different landscape grass types per layer. And uh, for the purposes of demonstration, I have turned off the cold distances on all of them. And so we can see way out into the distance. All of these tiny little foliage. Oh, man. And that's, you know, again, that's a detail that I can't see. And so what I can do, I can go to my landscape grass types. Grab this one. So this is a landscape grass type asset, slightly different from a foliage asset. And we'll get into foliage assets in a second. And so the start and end call distances are very, very high. So again, let's do let's do a little test. Let's come down here, go into game view, stat RHI. Whew. Only two thousand draw calls because of dynamic instancing. Let's see what happens if we do this. Dynamic instancing zero. Ah, okay. So those are all instanced together, which is fine um, because they are all basically part of the instanced foliage actor of the level, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't bring these down. So maybe I only want to render these out to 5,000 units. So that brought everything in. And it's probably going to go through. Yeah, it's got to regenerate some stuff. It's got to think about what it's done. Because the settings in here are also, um, those are also settings that focus on um, distribution so it's going to have to it probably is regenerating those yep there it goes so now so that was dirt and that dirt layer you can see we're only rendering dirt out to 5000 units and of course this thing these things have lod's because really at a certain point we really can't see that detail and of course this is my little test map so there would of course be more environment art built on top of this that would hide just the the flat plane but call distances are critical um, because this is the, the first and cheapest way to, to discard stuff from rendering. The other thing that discards stuff from rendering is not something you necessarily have control over, but that is um, frustum calling, which we talked about earlier. And I can see that with freeze rendering. That's a really useful command. So freeze. So we can see that one of the things that we immediately frustum called, so frustum, the, the view, so that's the near clip plane, the far clip plane, and your FOVs. And so that looks at that, and it does, I think, bounce testing um, to see if something falls within your frame. And it'll discard. It won't even send to the GPU things that you cannot see. So stuff that's behind you, not going to see it. Um, if you have a big rock that has a really big bounce, but it's behind other stuff, it'll get sent to the GPU. And then on the GPU, we will figure out whether or not we need to do the base pass for it. Excuse me. So. Frostum calling basically said, nuke out, we're not going to render all of this landscape stuff behind you. So, and of course, you'll see rendering frozen up in the top left to let you know that that's happening. Boom. Let me pop that back in, right? So now that, you know, now my Frostum is, is getting updated every frame. Okay. So we're still focused on draw calls, right? So I do know that in my level, I'm just going to filter all foliage here. So I have these landscape grass types. I'm actually going to filter those out. So I have static mesh foliage and actor foliage, all great stuff. This is all placed. Um, Jacob, did you hand place these? Did you paint these in, or did you use foliage volumes? Both, actually. Um, right now, the project, we have a few uh, larger foliage volumes that just helps you expand the level uh, beyond what would make sense to hand paint stuff in. Uh, but of course, as soon as we're talking about small set dressing and very specific set dressing around other props, then we're not using the volumes anymore. Then 
actually starting to hand paint these in. Yeah. Right. Because again, art, artistic control is really important. So oh, yes. uh, the cool thing is a lot of the, uh, a lot of the settings for um, static mesh foliage are uh, bulk editable. Uh, so what I'm going to do, again, you can pin properties to add columns. And I will freely admit that I hit pin call distance and I started clicking around. I'm like, I can't, I can't edit these. What's going on? I can edit these. <laughs> so might be worth mentioning a little bit what, yeah. about the bulk, um, the bulk editing matrix. Yeah. This is, I mean, this is one of the things I do as a tech artist. Oh man. All that yellow is really bouncing. <laughs> Ray trace GI. Yeah, that one. Oh, yes. yeah. Um, so the bulk, the bulk edit property by property matrix thing is is really handy. One of the things I uh, hate to do as a tech artist is the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. My first tool was just automating a thing that toggled collision on and off because I just couldn't bear doing it by hand. Um, so that sorry, you the, can the small delay is. <laughs> oh no, you're fine. Um, so getting access to that is as easy as selecting a bunch of assets, going to asset actions, bulk edit by a property matrix. And that'll bring up everything that you have selected. And you can go in and you can select a subset of assets. So maybe I want to set the call distances on my fern. And maybe I'm going to say, you know, I want to call ferns at a thousand units. Boom. We pop ferns to a thousand units. And maybe I want to set dry plants to 500 units. Or maybe I want to go through and I want to grab everything. And I will say, you know what, I'm not, I just want to do some quick testing. Let's see how this goes. I can come in here and I say, you know, call everything out at 5,000 units. It's going to take a bit because it's got to go through and set those settings. And I'm just going to set that to 4,500, just be on the safe side. All right. So, you know, again, we, we looked at our scene. We said, you know, we're really not rendering anything out beyond 15,000 units. And at a certain point, you're not going to see the foliage anyways, or you're not going to see the trees anyways, or you're not going to see the clovers that are on the ground cover all the way at a, out at a distance. And we can just, we can say those can go away. Um, or not go away necessarily, but we don't need to render them. Again, only render the details that you can actually see. And of course, we're going to save those. And the, the bulk uh, added property uh, matrix is... I mean, not only for, for example, setting cull uh, distances. For me, as an artist, you, you sort of talk about getting in the zone uh, when, when you, for example, add a delay and start set dressing. You don't want to set dress and every two minutes stop because you need to change a setting and do something technical. You want to be in that zone for as long as possible to, to sort of stay productive and actually get work done. Um, so what we do, for example, is experiment a lot with uh, different bitmap settings for textures, for example. So how can I reduce, for example, texture size um, to just make sure that my GPU memory just isn't completely overloaded with just loading massive amounts of 4K and 8K textures uh, while still keeping very high quality uh, and, and crisp looks in the actual scene. And so instead of you going in and changing every single texture, be like, yeah, this works, and then going back, now this doesn't work, um, and now I'm stuck editing textures for, I don't know, uh, four hours instead of actually set dressing, uh, it's way easier to to just go into the property matrix and just bulk change these. Especially once you've found a setting that works and you want to apply to previously worked on textures. Oh, Matt, you're muted. And don't forget, you can also set up your texture groups. Yes. Um, right. So, so you may have texture groups. You know, world. I want to make sure that the MIPLOD bias on world is is one or or something like that. I want to discard the highest thing. You can do that here. You can set up your compression settings. All of those. You know, you have you have a lot of control just by setting the texture group. And of course, you. And, and what I love about that is that it is uh, effectively non-destructive. Um, you can go in and you can change all these different settings for your texture groups without having to go through and then manually update everything. Um, so sometimes I might I might do this toward the end of a project when when I'm really I'm trying to get you know a half millisecond back, and it's like all right, well we've got 
five forty ninety six normal maps. I'm like, well, maybe those are a little big, and maybe we don't really see those details, and maybe we can chop those down to ten twenty fours or twenty forty eights. And that's again because we're trying to get like that little bit left. Right now, we're focused on a big chunk and how much. Um, again, how much work do we have to do that affects as many pixels as possible? without affecting the overall quality of the scene. That's what I'm focused on right now. And that's what I think a lot of people can do. And they can do really, really quickly, right? You know, I, I saved eight milliseconds off the scene just by not rendering shadows that I don't even see. And then and now we're going from there. So I'm going to open up um, for the next thing on draw call reduction. Um, I'm going to open up the other map that might take a little bit. Victor, is there a question from the chat that I can take? Yeah, we got plenty. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> You're going to be here a while. Oh, boy. Um, do large textures in landscape layers impact performance? Sampling large textures does affect performance. The bigger the texture, the, the, um, the more time it takes to filter and sample and all that fun stuff. Um, and... And as the rendering engineers have told me, we have done um, we've done some optimizations to that so that it's not it's not quite like it was, you know, because that that is advice that I remember from you know from the Xbox 360 days. Uh, large texture is really expensive to sample, and that's to an extent still true. Um, but if you are um, using runtime virtual textures for your landscapes, like we are in this, it actually ends up ultimately being cheaper to do it with a runtime virtual texture, even though the runtime virtual texture is effectively larger um, because of a lot of the optimizations we've done there, uh, which are really, really cool. Um, and I think uh, there was a live stream about that um, with, with uh, was it Jeremy Moore? Yeah, we did one uh, right as we shipped. I don't exactly remember which version that was, but if you go and search inside Unreal virtual texturing or virtual textures, you'll, you'll find that live stream. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that, that I noticed while I was working, while I was looking at the scene, and of course, while I'm looking at my stat RHI, right? So I have many, many, many thousands of draw calls. Um, and one of the things, and this goes back to, you know, if you, are, if you are looking at perf early and often, and if you are, you as a tech artist or you or an environment artist are communicating freely back and forth, keep the lines of communication open, um, then you can catch stuff early and you can talk about how to construct assets or construct your environment in a way that is conducive to perf. So uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, we have dynamic mesh instancing, which does save a number of draw calls. As we saw, that saved whatever 10,000 draw calls for that one shot. It might be more, it might be less in this scene. Um, but that only goes so far. So again, as we said, that that is, that is same geometry, and that includes LOD. So LOD0 and LOD1 are different geometries, even though they're from the same actor. Uh, and it's also kind of doing some clustering. So it'll, it'll say, you know, uh, these five trees over here are going to be a dynamic instance together. And these five trees, even though they're the same geometry, but they're on the other side of the screen, those might be a different thing. There's ways we can get around this. And so one of the things I noticed as uh, Victor was talking, or um, I'm sorry, Jacob was talking about uh, constructing the cottages, the thatched roof cottages. I can't believe I made it this far in without talking about the thatched roof cottages. So these, Victor and, oh my God, uh, Jacob has gone through and constructed these thatched roof cottages with, in, oh, that's why, translucent selection with individual thatches as individual um, static meshes. And this has created a very, very beautiful thatch roof. You I could possibly What's skip to the, to the house on the right. I think it's lit a bit more beautifully. Um, th that one on, on the bottom. This one? That. This one's yeah. your favorite? Okay. And then on the other side of it, yes, there, there we go. The, the volume sort of <laughs> starts yes. to pop up there. I really... I really love these. Um, and luckily, a few of these have been split off into their own sublevels, so we can um, we can work on these. And I'm going to go into unlit mode. Um, we can work on these directly and specifically, so I can show you uh, kind of what's going on here. So 
I pre-staged, uh, you know, my little Emerald Lagasse. All right. And then we're going to let this rest for four hours and four hours later, we're going to pull out the perfectly rested thing. Um, so I noticed that there are a number of actors that were used to construct the thatched roof. In fact, 563, 460. And so each of these is going to, you know, it's going to LOD separately. It's might not dynamically batch instance together quite the same. Um, and, and Jacob, you were telling me that one of the things that you wanted to maintain is that nice kind of gradient as you, as you move away from it so that it's not, you know, the whole, if the whole roof LOD popped all at once, we'd notice, right? Exactly. This is like my quote unquote basic artistic brain went, okay, I, I have this thatched roof and I know that I need a, a base mesh and I need some sort of cards on top just to fake <laughs> masked volume. Um, and so my, my first instinct was, well, when I have all of this in one mesh, and I get away from the camera um, or, or start getting away from the uh, from the object, then obviously all of that will sort of pop out in an instance. Mm -hmm. And what I did uh, for these is first of all, set their culling distances, but also have the opacity uh, decrease based on distance to camera. So mm -hmm. they are on their own, even if they are not actually culled, fading away, which sort of helps you hide that sort of immediate uh, mm -hmm. disappearing of cards. Um, but in my head, it made more sense to keep those as individual meshes mm -hmm. or individual pieces, which could cull out that more aggressively without me rendering a completely transparent object uh, for right. longer than it needs to be rendered. Right, because translucency can get expensive. Um, so I so that so now we're going to get into the uh, construction without affecting visual quality. So I want to make sure that that these LOD these cards fade uh, nicely and separately. Um, and I will freely admit that I changed the material so that we can do this live. How dare uh, you! <laughs> did I leave that plugged in? I left that plugged in. So so the way he's doing that is is down here. So he takes the uh, he takes the opacity mask, does a little bit of multiplication on it, and then we do um, basically we get the distance between the camera and the position of the pixel that we are drawing. We add our fade out distance and we divide that. So this is basically a normalize to range function. Um, we do a little math on that, saturate it to keep that value from zero to one, and then we lerp between our base opacity and zero. And we plug that straight into the opacity mask. And so that's how he's doing the, the, um, the per pixel fade out, which is super, super cool and super, super good. And again, it's a, on a mask material. So those are a little cheaper. Um, but what this means is that all of this is happening at the material level. And I can use this to my advantage. So I'm not going to move the camera at all. I'm going to stat RHI. So we can see how many draw calls we're working with. So, you know, this this house effectively is uh, anywhere between 800 and 1,200 draw calls. It's an entire mobile game, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> you think about, you know, I remember somebody saying like the sound file for for the the Sega at the beginning of Sonic is like one eighth of the total cartridge. You know, this is. These are the, all the draw calls you get for your entire mobile game. Um, so it's good if you can be wasteful, but you know, it's, I, it's smarter to do it the smart way, obviously. Right. <laughs> well, so so the cool thing is we have a couple of built-in tools that can make this really, really, really easy. Um, I'm going to show you two things you can do, and both of them are just with a right click. So uh, the draw calls popped up there because of the highlighting. So. We're going to remember our old value of a thousand. We're going to select all of these bad boys. There we go. Select all those bad boys. Right click. Merge actors. And the one I'm going to use is this one over on the right. Harvest geometry from selected actors and merge them into an actor with multiple instanced static mesh components. This is what I would consider a destructive change. 
Um, so this, this might be something, you know, as we're getting toward the end of this project, Jacob, uh, we know that the houses aren't going to change around too much. We might, we might pull this trigger. There's so we... There's a way to make it non-destructive um, that I used in a project where we basically have a separate sub-level where we keep all of the original uh, pre, pre-merging, so where we keep all the meshes. And so w- right before you do the merge, you essentially copy over to your unmerged um, level and you make sure that that level is not loaded by default. And then you mm-hmm. can work it uh, or do it in a non-destructive way where you then later can open up that sub-level, select meshes in there and merge them and then move that over. Right. And so so as you're going through your project and you want to set something up like that, do it. It makes things so much easier on you. So for the time being, we're just going to do this little test. Again, our draw calls were around 1,000. And again, our, our dynamic instancing does a lot of work here. Um, but we can help it out. We can tell it what to instance together. And we can do that right here. And so the the key to me that this was a good idea is that we have maybe four different static mesh assets, thatch, L, light, heavy, SM card. I think there were maybe four or five, but there are a lot of them. And that's what cued me in that this, this was kind of the way to go. So we're going to do all that. We're going to turn it into an actor. It's going to be instant static mesh components. Boom, merge actors. I haven't moved the camera. That was 500 draw calls. That's a mobile game. (laughs) Ship it. Ship it. Um, And so now this whole thing, roof base, haha. Give me, there it is. So the whole actor itself is all of these little, it's all of these. They're all instant static mesh components, which means that the computer knows that these should all be drawn in the same draw call. So now I know that there are there are probably some more draw calls in here, um, depending on how things are set up. Same kind of thing. So that's not the only thing. That's not the only thing that we can do. So let's turn those bad boys back on. Okay, that was a lot. Um, so say maybe, you know, for whatever hardware reason, we can't instance all of these together. What we can do instead... Oh boy, scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Takes a while scrolling through 500 individual actors. All right. <laughs> so I can come back here, I can merge actors, and I'm going to do this uh, harvest geometry and merge it into a single actor. So, so what this is going to do is create a new static mesh actor. And we're going to put this under my developer folder. Oh, secret's out. So this is creating a mesh proxy. So this is this is going to do a little bit of extra work to generate this geometry, and it's going to bake some stuff down. And I might just tell this to not. Um, so this is, uh, I would say that this version of the merge actors tool is really really good if you have a bunch of, um, if you want to create a whole new static mesh, merge it together, combine it do a bunch of extra optimization. That's really good. That's what the um, the proxy is really, really, really good for. Um, maybe less optimal for this use case. What I really wanted to show you was merge actors. So what I want to do is merge all of these into a single static mesh, not change the geometry at all, but merge the materials together. That's this one over on the left, grouping them by materials. Because in certain circumstances, depending on how you press the buttons, um, you could end up with all of these merged together, and each mesh will be its own element, its own material element, and that, for certain purposes, is a different material. Um, So when we say same geometry, same material, different material, that's more draw calls. So we're going to merge that together, developers folder. Yeah, that's what we're looking for. Okay. <laughs> Name schemes. They're really important. All right. So now I have this, and I can drag that into the world. And we can see that that's, you know, that's all of our thatches grouped together. I can come in here. I can see that it's only the materials for the thatches that, that are there. There's only five. So this is now effectively five draw calls. 
but it does have the LOD popping question. But because we've added that little extra dithering to the mask material, it kind of hides that transition really, really nicely. So the caveat with this, as you merge static mesh actors together, this is you know a unique asset. This is going to have its own memory footprint, which may or may not be desirable. But these are all options. These are all options that you can take a, you can take advantage of, um, and to keep in mind. So so as uh, Jacob and I progress with this scene, as we you know look to optimize it as much as we we possibly can, squeeze out all of those those GPUs, all those frames per second, we're probably going to go through and probably going to instance these together um, just to reduce that number of draw calls. And there are a bunch of places that we can do that. So I'm going to bop back to the main map. And I'll take another question, or at least come up for air. We can do that. Make sure you drink something. I am. Perfect. A little bit of water. Perfect. Um... Matt Lulu 123123 one, two, three asked, are there any updates in regards to full trees from Quixel? Ooh, good question, Jacob. Uh, well, I am i can't really comment on that directly, uh, other than it is being worked on, um, and it's going to be good. <laughs> it's I'm excited. Good. Great. It's, it's, going to be, it's going to be great. Yeah, I'm I'm not really allowed to to directly talk about that stuff. Um it's still something we we want to guard very tightly, um but it's it's going to look great. I can tell you that you'll know when <laughs> when we know. <laughs> when we know, I will blast it. I will I will sing it from the rooftops. I will stand on top of my roof with a bugle playing some beautiful tune. Um, oh yes, when 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 they release, I'm I'm gonna do a full dance routine just for them. I think <laughs> maybe it's... I can get you on for another live stream. Oh <laughs> yes, please, absolutely, <laughs> <laughs> gladly. So, you know, talking about draw call optimization, talking about construction. So uh, they have uh, they've built out this. This is the. <laughs> the the windmill. This is the best example. <laughs> and, this, and this is what we call kit bashing. This yes. is when you got a kit of stuff and you bash it all together. Uh, this is the, literally what? in level prototyping for blockout. Right. Um, so this was one of the, uh, you know, uh, what you call it? Um, oh, we're getting into the live stream where my brain starts falling apart. Um, this is kit bashing. I, one of the first games I ever worked on, we built like this, um, but there were some optimizations in that game that instanced everything together and, and um, and kind of did those draw calls because that was a, a, a different game engine. Here we've got tools to do that, right? So as uh, as this gets finalized, as somebody said, you know, puts the stamp approval, yes, this is what we want the windmill to look like. We'll go through, we'll merge it together. Uh, we might uh, instance everything together so everything um, draws really, really quickly. The other thing, I can't believe I forgot about this. Um, and Chris Murphy has talked about this before, Our uh, one of our evangelists out of... Uh, Australia. So we have a, a foliage dense level and a foliage dense, I don't know, you could do that. A foliage dense level is kind of a, a cue. There are some cues in here. Um, yeah. Uh, no, I'm going to hear this way. Um, so we go into our project settings, we go to rendering, we go down to optimization. So right now I have early Z pass. So that's um, when we're rendering our depth pass, I'm going to set that to opaque and masked meshes. And it's going to think about that. And then I'm going to turn on mask material only in early Z pass. So this will basically help the GPU know how to pick out masked materials in the Z pass. So I just turn that bad boy on and we're going to restart the project. I'm going to come up for air and we're going to take another question. Sure thing. I was just looking at that. Um, so Knthvdrf asked, how does Unreal handle a huge amount of geometry overlap when crafting an entire environment full of overlapping objects? As a primarily mobile and VR developer, the sheer volume of triangles and range of textures seems too much to handle. Mm -hmm. So that, I mean, that's kind of what we're, 
that's what we're talking about. If you have a bunch of geometry stacked on top of each other, that's when we start talking about maybe turning on HCB occlusion, which is, I mean to get a better explanation of it, but it's, it's effectively a faster but more conservative way of picking out what to occlude. Um, and there's, there's usually tricks to figure out whether or not that needs to be enabled or disabled. It's a project setting. Um, so that is something to look into. Of course, we also have, I think, VR down Rob inclusion is another um, occlusion method for VR specifically that, that can be really, really useful. Um, and the other thing to think about, so um, Victor, I, was, I mentioned this before we started the call, and I was meant to work this in early on. Um, the, the like hierarchical instance static mesh font maker that you had made for, um, for a VR project. And, and you have to start getting into those like really, really nitty gritty, um, optimizations at that point, because now you have to render everything in both eyes, which means twice, which means more stuff. And you have to do it 90 times a second. So that's 11.11, 11, 11, 11 milliseconds. Um, you have to render it, you have to render it more. And yeah, I, I really sympathize with, with, um, with the amount of optimization that you have to do there. I know that wasn't like the perfect answer to that. Um, but so mask and early Z pass really, really helps us. Um, again, because we have so much foliage, we have so many mask materials. And we'll see how that affects our quad overdraw. I think that looks better. I think yes. we'll work on it. Again, we're gonna we're gonna keep optimizing it, and and you'll you'll see what we are able to do um, when we don't have to do it live, uh, and we can keep going. But yeah, that was that's another project setting that really really helps. And if I want to, so this is this is a good example of if I want to see if that really really helped, I can go back and I can. Um, I can run my trace. I could run my full perf test because that's a that is a project level setting um, that's going to affect every pixel on the screen anytime it's rendered. That's that's a cue that it's time to do the full perf test instead of doing it camera by camera or something like that. So while that's in compiling, do we have another question? Sure do. Um, Mug seventeen asked. Are draw calls the only reason for high texture performance loss? Is if so, is it because of texture complexity or size? Hmm. Let's see if I can parse this right. So a texture is going to be an input into the material that is part of the draw call. So if you have a if you have a super high resolution texture, um, which means super high resolution MIPS, and that is going to a very complex material and it is it is spread across the entire screen, then yeah, that's that's going to be more expensive. The, the reason that number of draw calls is expensive is because it's the number of operations that we have to do over and over and over and over and over again. So the fewer the fewer operations we have to do, the cheaper thing, the, the faster things can go, uh, is, is effectively how that goes. So if, if a high resolution texture is an input into a bunch of draw calls, then it is going to be expensive. So I'm going to full screen this because again, that is the basis of our test is the full screen. And I'm going to do KE star start perf. 30 milliseconds. Hey, that shot's down to 40 milliseconds. That's great because that started at 60. Yeah, that looks so. So, so just our, our shadow change and our mass material change, that's starting to bring things down. That's great. I'm super excited about that. And that doesn't include our, our uh, draw call optimizations for the thatched roofs um, that we will do at a later date. Uh, and I have buried one perf bomb. So even I don't, I don't even need to go look at the, the trace, but I can, I can look at that and say, yeah, that, that looks a lot faster. So I'm going to hit exit and see if that works instead of hitting Alt F4. I mean, one thing, uh, for example, when, when we talk about the, uh, the thatched roofs, is the biggest reason why they're separate right now and actually not smartly merged and and reduced in terms of their the draw calls mm -hmm. is that we might want to make changes to them it's the great right. thing of having all of that 
in engine right now and it's also a great thing why, why we have these in sub levels so that we can constantly uh, and continuously update these meshes if need be and push them back to the main level um, but if you think about how many draw calls we've lost uh, or we've saved um, by merging these together in one single house and we have uh, let me lie i think eight or nine houses with completely thatched roofs in the level Mm -hmm. um so this is going to be a, a huge save so even now just seeing how rather quick and simple performance optimizations can bring uh down performance cost even if one of the possibly biggest culprits is still there is is super encouraging and uh yeah mm -hmm. yeah so i can look at my unreal timing insights so I figured out what happened last time. Instead of uh, exiting out of the scene, I hit Alt F4. So some of the shutdown stuff didn't happen, which is why um, I didn't have my timing file. Because uh, this gets written out kind of either you are connecting to a live session or uh, the file gets written out. So what happened was uh, I crashed the game, basically, instead of exiting smartly. So I can look at this and I can see that, yeah, it looks like uh, you know, it looks like I'm looking at my inclusive average 41, right? That was like 60 earlier or 58 earlier, 41. This is going great. So I'm, I'm really happy with that. So that was two changes. I barely had to do any work. It saved me 20 milliseconds. Um, let me check my notes, see how we're doing. That's true, base pass. Aha, that's right. So sometimes... Uh, as you're working on your frame, as you're working on a scene, you're working down this list, right? We're burning down this list to see, you know, what needs to cast shadows. Maybe I turn off shadow casting on a bunch of stuff that's really close to the ground, or I know it's going to be in shadow all the time. Um, maybe I'm optimizing my materials. Maybe I'm changing, you know, how I do shadows or something like that. And I really get it down. I get it. I squeeze, 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 squeeze. And so I have to start looking in other places for performance. And maybe I have to look for a quarter of a millisecond somewhere. And maybe I say, hey, post-processing is super high. That's really strange. Where, how did that get there? He asked, knowing the answer to that question. So, oh, this is a good example. So maybe I don't, maybe I need to figure out what's costing me time in post-processing, but I don't want to fire up RenderDoc. So if I hit control shift comma, that will pop open the GPU prof or the GPU visualizer, which is one of my favorite tools. Um, Haha, <laughs> there we go. So this is a visual representation of the uh, of the kind of stuff you you would see in your um, in render doc, uh, but you don't have the granularity to like in render doc. I can find this. I can look at the geometry that is being sent to the GPU that's getting rendered. Um, this one is a little less featured, but it is still super useful for this purpose. Um, this is sometimes where I will start on a project. So I can look at this. I, you know, I can see all of the different groups of draws. I can go in here. You know, it takes me what 0.5 milliseconds to render my virtual texture. That's great. Um, but then I can look at shadow depths and I can say, hey, what's going on with my shadows? Oh man, I've got I've got two, I've got two different shadow atlases rendering. That's really strange. I can come in here and I go, oh man. I have all of these other dynamic lights that are casting shadows. And I can look at that and I can say, man, I'm spending five milliseconds to render dynamic shadows for lights that maybe I don't even see or lights that don't even need to be rendering shadows. Oof, that's five milliseconds right there. Pop those bad boys out. But maybe, maybe we're past that point. Maybe, you know, maybe we need to get down into the post-processing. You know, there's, there's all the stuff that happens in post-processing. Some of it's useful, some of it maybe not. Um, motion blur is happening there. Let's see if my post-processing material is happening. <laughs> Did my post-processing material not apply? Oh, how shameful. So let's say I had a pro, a, I had a post-processing material that was super, super expensive. Yeah, that didn't save. That's so strange. We can add it though. Post-process. And you'll notice nothing happened. There's a reason for that. Okay, so I added that post-processing material. Again, my camera hasn't changed. Pop this open. 
scene. Do, 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 post processing. There it is. There's my post process material. And let's say that this was super, super big. <clears throat> But I can look at this and I can see that, yeah, this post-process material was taking three milliseconds, let's say. And I would then I would know to go look at that and, and say, all right, so a post-process material is something that is happening to every pixel, every frame, no matter what. And so I might look at this material and see what it's doing. And I might look at this material and go, this is doing a blur. And it's doing a lot of it. So we're sampling the scene color nine times. And then we're doing an if on it a bunch of times. Ifs are really, ifs are really instruction heavy, um, and we're adding it all together, dividing by nine. And that might be a super expensive material. One of the things I might do in here, I might use a lerp instead of an if. Um, I'll show you what that looks like. This is my this is my little fun hack. I'm going to component mask this. So this comes out as a gradient from zero to one, and maybe I want I want to do like so maybe I want something to be either red or blue. Let's say that. Um, and instead of using an if, and you know ifs give us really hard lines because they're they're basically only running per pixel, and maybe that's not optimal. So we'll do that. We'll do that. And maybe I say you know I want if it is um, greater than 0.5, I want it to be blue. And if it is less than 0.5, I want it to be red. So I can say divide by I remember my math. Yeah. Divide by 2. Remember your math. And then I'm going to floor it. Aha, no, that's right. Right, I remember my math now. I went to art school. Sometimes I don't remember. Divide by 0.5. So that means anything that is more than 0.5 is going to be more than 1. So 0.75 divided by 0.5 is going to be 1.5. And then what I can do is I can come here with a floor. Now that floor says anything that is less than 0.5 or anything that is less than 1 is going to be 0. Anything that is less than 2 is going to be 1. And that means that anything is, that is less than 0.5 is 0. And anything that is greater than 0.5 is 1. And I can plug that into my LERP. And now anything that is less than 0.5 is red. Everything that is greater than 0.5 is blue. And it saves me, I think I ran the numbers on this, a couple of instructions over using an if method. And these are, and now of course we're getting into super, super really nitty gritty optimization of, you know, I have to make sure that I save 10 instructions out of this material. And maybe this does save you some instructions. And maybe this is in your master material and your master material is applied to literally every material in your game or literally every static mesh in your game. And so it would behoove you to find ways to optimize that. Because again, how many times are we doing this optimization? How many pixels are we affecting with a change that we are about to make? And I think, I think I've got it all. I think I covered everything. And you covered a lot. Everything. <laughs> not, so not, not everything. So this is, this is, um, I do a lot of performance optimization. I love doing this. I love talking about this. Um, and this is, um, there, there's so much more that goes into this. There's, um, you know, we have to, we can talk more about occlusion. We can talk more about construction methods. We can talk more about how do we optimize our shadow pass even further. There's so much more that goes into us into this. And I, I really love talking about it because I like it when things run at frame rate. That's kind of my, um, that's, that's one of my favorite things. So yeah, I think, I think that'll cover it. Questions. Yes. And something that you were touching on there that I, I thought we could start off with the Q and a section to talk about, um, often I see the question, you know, like what, what's the performance, what is my performance budget? And that's mm. an impossible question. Right, it, you, it is. It you is can't a, answer that question. And so, could you talk a little bit about 
the difference between um, all of the things you need to take in mind when you are working towards performance of your game. And, and I want to hear a little bit about sort of, you know, the difference of like time cost of, of versus like the savings you get and how that actually applies in the real world for say a game studio or a film studio. Mm, okay. So uh, when you're coming up, you have to decide your budgets. And as I mentioned at kind of at the top of this, and I will reiterate this, your budgets are a reflection of your values. What, what graphical features do you value more than others? These are, it's always going to be relative to something else. So if I have a game where I know that I need dynamic lighting, every, you know, maybe every static mesh is going to be dynamic. Um, so, and I need to hit 60 frames per second. Or, or, or maybe, you know, I'll give myself some room. I'll say 30 frames per second, so 33 milliseconds. So right off the top, you know, maybe I have a bunch of characters running around here too. Maybe I'm making a, a, um, a, a hero shooter or something like that. I will say, all right, I'm going to reserve about 8 milliseconds just off the top for uh, my characters. Maybe give myself some buffer because I know I'm going to have a bunch of characters running around. There's going to be a bunch of particle effects. Um, I might be doing uh, some in-world UI with with mesh widgets that are dynamic, and and that's going to be a lot. So I'm going to say, you know, maybe that'll give me about eight milliseconds because sometimes your characters only take up a little bit of your screen. The environment is going to cover a huge amount of your screen. That's why I I will say, hey, for that game, I'm going to give myself 25 milliseconds. And if I have 25 milliseconds to to render everything, that's shadows, that's base pass, that's lights. That's volumetrics. That's post processing. That's all of my my environment, my environmental effects. It might be, um, you know, I say my base pass should be six milliseconds, and I'm throwing out numbers, and you can change these numbers based on your values. So if you know that you don't really need dynamic lighting, you can bake all of your lighting, and you want to spend more time in your base pass. Great, eight milliseconds in your base pass, but you may have to sacrifice some of your lighting features. Maybe you don't get um, light function materials on everything. You don't use IES profiles on all of your dynamic lights because those are expensive too. Um, so maybe it's, you know, I might give myself, yeah, two milliseconds for GPU scene update. Great, that's fine. Screen space AO, 0.2 milliseconds, that's totally fine. If I see that number creep up, then, you know, something, maybe somebody changed a quality slider. Um, and it's all it's all give and take. Um, usually, you're probably going to spend most of your time in your base pass. You're probably going to spend a lot of time in your lighting. Um, and then translucency, of course, is its own separate pass these days. So if I have like a bunch of windows in my downtown city scene, I'm going to want to spend more time in translucency. That might be two milliseconds. And these are all little things that we can do to optimize our performance. Um, as you and and I think it's really important to think about these things really really early on. Maybe you need to make a stress test level, and you just you take this level and you throw everything you have at it. You turn on every feature in your your post processing. You crank all the quality sliders all the way up, and you see what your scene looks like. And if you're like, well, that's too expensive. Um, you know, all of these features turned on is is and building it this way is maybe not going to be the best way. Uh, maybe I know that I should only I should reduce my poly budget, or maybe I know that I shouldn't spend, you know, sixteen milliseconds rendering shadows. Um, these are all these are all things to that I think should be part of like pre production in your game. Um, these cannot these cannot be overlooked because the 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 most stressful thing for everybody in a project is when you get to two months before you're supposed to submit for cert and oh we got to start talking about performance and you know you got you everybody's been making everything look really really good and nobody's been looking at performance and now as the tech artist i might have to be the big bad guy that comes in and says no you got to take out all your polygons um and it's that's you know that and that's stressful for everybody that's stressful for me that's stressful for the artists because they put a lot of work into it and they put a lot of work into stuff that isn't going to ship with the game because we weren't thinking about perf holistically and from an early, an early, early point and thinking about our budgets. I hope that 
I hope that answers it. Yeah, I think so. It's always great to hear, you know, you've clearly done this a lot. And so just getting your thoughts out there, the terminology and everything else. And I know that that's um, extremely valuable. Yeah, let's let's move on to some of the questions we've um, we received. There are a couple of really good ones here. I'm um, going to start with a question from Lufinit. He asked, or they asked, what is the best way to test performance for computers slash consoles with different specifications without buying all of them? Ooh. <laughs> that's, that's really tough. So uh, I will talk about a situation where um, I have had to optimize perform. And yeah, so I've had to think about performance for VR for a low spec project or, or a, a VR project and worry about it on a low spec machine. And so what I might end up doing to kind of get an idea of what that looks like is I might come into, where did it go? There it is. Um, I might come into my engine scalability settings and I might crank them down to low just to see what it looks like. Um, and then, you know, if I do that on my machine, it might be 10 milliseconds. And you're like, great. All right. That's a 10 milliseconds. Ship it. I'm like, well, no, that's not the, that's not the target. So maybe you have to do a little bit of mental math and, and think to yourself, all right, well, if I need to hit 10 milliseconds on a 980, that means it should be five milliseconds on a 20, 2080. Um, and you can kind of, you, you might have to scale your numbers down and say, yeah, if it's, if it needs to be well optimized on a low spec machine, it should be hyper optimized on a high spec machine. That's one way to think about it. Um, at the end of the day though, there's kind of no, there's no substitute for, for testing on device because at the end of the day, you know, if I need to hit. 30 milliseconds on a Xbox One, the only way I will know for absolute certain that I'm hitting 30 milliseconds on the F Xbox One is to test it on the Xbox One. Yeah, that real world test is it, only the real way that you can get those numbers, right? Um, mm -hmm. I was saying this in chat a little bit earlier when the question came up that, you know, it all depends on your budget, but if you're able to scrap together a GPU from a friend, um, bring your build over, you know, to someone, maybe not during these times, but um, <laughs> send it over, you know, um, I won't set up a blueprint that would just automatically run um, uh, console commands on development mm -hmm. builds. And I asked the community for the game as well as people I knew, hey, can you please spend a couple of minutes and just download this and run it and take me mm -hmm. a couple of screenshots and send that back to me? Right, so so you raise a really good point. I've already got this project set up with a um, with a blueprint that does that. That's a great idea. So heck, you know, I've got this. I'm on my my workstation, my um, my big powerful game development PC. My personal PC is not quite as powerful. Um, I I I will readily admit that. Um, maybe I need to test how this scene runs on a 780. Actually, I think it's a 760. Um, so I might, you know, package this project or I might grab that staged build and I might copy it over my PC and I'll just sit there, run the game, KE star, start perf, and then zip that up and send it, you know, send it over to Unreal Insights over here. I mean, especially if you're not working on a project that is locked under NDAs. And you have friends and just e even family, and you're just working on uh, yourself. Yeah. Uh, then Jesus, feel free to send that over and ask them. Hey, you don't need to know anything about how a game engine works or anything, <laughs> right. or how to play a game. Just please open that and tell me what the readout on X Y Z is. And especially mm -hmm. with, uh, for example, Matt's blueprint that will be provided in the, uh, in yeah. the project. That should be a huge help to all of you. And the, the best thing about having a lot of friends and family that are not in the industry or, or not really interested in gaming, they won't have good hardware. <laughs> so you get optimal testing beds uh, for old and, and sort of out of date or lower spec hardware mm -hmm. uh, that you can test your game against. And 18 I, processes running in the background. And Yes. Um. <laughs> you know, I, I, have, I have a very old iPhone 
very old. It's an iPhone seven, right? But you know, I got test flight installed. I'm, and and you know my my mom has test flight installed on on her iPhone, which is older than mine, I think. And she knows how to use it. She can download a thing. Same thing. You know, maybe you have a little UI button that you set up for your iOS game. Start perf. Um, these are these are all or your Android. Um, these are all totally fine. Ask your friends. Yeah, and this is something that you might want to think about when you sort of in the initial design process of your game. Um, if we take a look at, so I had Sumo Digital on and they were talking about their uh, mobile game Spider for Apple Arcade. And mm -hmm. they, to ship on Apple Arcade, you're required to hit a certain benchmark or a certain year back worth of iOS devices that you're required mm -hmm. to run on. And so yeah. they, they needed all of those devices in house to actually th throughout their development test that. And so if you're a smaller studio, that might be a budget that you're required to um, to think about already when you set off. Will you be able to you know, hit the performance benchmarks on all the devices that you're supposed to launch on? What's that going to cost us? What's that going to add in terms of you know, QA um, time and money? And so it's, it's definitely something that you should do throughout. And I think Matt brought up something really important earlier. Do not wait until the last couple of months. But, you know, even the first game build that you package to have anyone test, you should run a little, a little performance ben benchmark on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's yeah. especially if you don't want to uh, annoy artists and art directors, because if, if they lock down visuals and artists spend countless hours dumping little teeny tiny stones uh, into, into crevices of your level, um, and the art director really nailed them into, yeah, this is supposed to look like that and we're not going to change that. And then at the last minute before shipping, when everything was, okay, yeah, we, we, we've done our job, Techard comes in and says, well, we're sorry, but we, we have to nuke half of your art process or, or progress. Mm -hmm. um, nobody's going to be happy in, in, in that instance. So yeah, make sure to start as early as possible and be just considerate. I mean, even with talking to other people and their experiences, uh, when when you don't have quickly available amazing tech artists uh, to to your rescue um just ask in the community um and ask for other people's experience because a, a lot of the stuff i see new people or new users struggle with are relatively i don't want to to call it basic but surface level so what matt for example touched on easy steps that are super effective that affect all pixels on the screen and maybe you just don't know about these things just ask around and these Starter level optimization passes will help you out a lot. Yeah. And that also goes back to the, the, the time question, right? Because sometimes mm -hmm. it might not even be worth the time getting those extra milliseconds. It might not be worth the cost. You might not be able to afford, afford that, you know, studio-wise, right? Um, and that's where why performance and optimization will, for the rest of our lives, be a very big topic that is complex, but there are steps to take um, mm -hmm. to mitigate the problems that might, uh, that might come to your project a little bit later. Um, yeah. Let's move on to some of, the, some of the questions here to make sure we get them. Um, yeah. Lil, Lil Sarah Lee asked, I'm making an open world map with world composition, mm -hmm. currently empty with just a basic landscape material. I mm -hmm. constantly get small lags when I move from one streaming level to another. How can mm -hmm. I diagnose this? Ooh. I don't specifically know the answer to that question, but it sounds like it might be a hitch. So like a, you know, a little one frame thing. I will uh, absolutely post in the forums after this. I'm going to type my note now. Um, I will post in the forums after this the, a, a quick and easy way to do that. Um, because yeah, that is, it, it, those are really, really tough because that's not like, a, yeah, I can set my camera up and, and go and you can't like, Oh, let me in render doc, just hit the GPU capture, like right at the last second. Um, those things will, will show up in, you'll see those happen in unreal insights, those hitches. And then you can dive into that, that specific call. Um, and then I, I believe there's a way to like, for the, for the game to detect when a hitch occurred and then output a bunch of data about that. And I will, I will post some info about that. And forums after yeah, this. there's a console command perhaps that is from an older time before unreal insights but uh stat start hitch or and, and and then stop you can actually set a threshold for 
like a certain process that took a certain amount of time and you can mm -hmm. dump all those to a doc and then go through, hey, what are these hitches coming from? So there are ways to troubleshoot that. Yeah. And uh, Matt mentioned the form thread, shameless plug. Um, I also was going to throw in there if, if you know, if you're curious, have these questions, the forms are a great place where you can talk to other developers in the community. And I also want to drop uh, unrealslackers.org, which is the unofficial Discord community for Unreal Engine. There are many of those, but Slackers is great. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. Um, I, I thought this, this is a pretty good question. Uh, Svan, Svanzo has two asked. Uh, quick question. What is the best mechanism to help artists slash engineers understand the guidelines for a particular target platform? Um, he, he's bringing some details here. Um, uh, does an art type... Oh, he's referencing Linter, which is one of the um, tools on the marketplace that allow you to uh, troubleshoot or take a look at um, how your project performs. It's used if you're actually looking to submit your content to the marketplace and you can use that tool to get a quick check to see if you have anything that's like completely whack, you know, that's easy to change um, in terms of performance and uh, naming hierarchies and stuff like that. Um, oh, oh, okay. I, I think I conceptually understand what this is. It's basically like a, a project level, uh, go through, look at my settings, you know, mm -hmm. see if there's something. Yeah, because um, Linter is a thing that I'm, vaguely familiar with from Python, where it'll go through your, your Python script. And yeah, OK. Um, I don't know. Uh, to, to Again, there's there's really no substitute for for testing on device and, and stress testing for device. And, and you might you might have to say, or, or you know, it's at a certain point, you may have to go through and set poly budgets and actor budgets and, and things like that. Um, but there's nothing nothing is better than communication um, and open and honest and, and constant communication so that everybody everybody's on the same page. Everybody's on the same page from the start of the project. Those are all, I think, super, super critical. And educate throughout and update the team with your findings, right? If you're the person um, yeah. who is the dedicated performance um, judge. I yeah. don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, they're, yeah, they're the, 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 performance guardian you know uh when i was uh before i i worked at before i started at epic every project i worked on um i the you know qa was doing their uh perf analysis they were sending the you know okay here's the 10 cameras from this map here's the 10 cameras from that map and then that would cue me and go into highlight areas and then i would go through and do the highlight report of you know all right this camera took 10 milliseconds um and yesterday it was taking eight milliseconds and here's the breakdown of what changed you know what the deltas were i would have uh i'll show you the the spreadsheet that i have for for our little project here um super super simple right now just so i can see how things change but here's all our cameras this gives us a little heartbeat from change list to change list to change list um to show us what what the cameras were running at um, and these these are a little out of order because I hadn't set up the deterministic ordering uh, before I started this, but it gives you an idea of like, all right, when I started checking, things were rough, and then one day things were a lot better, and then the next day something changed, you know, these numbers went up, um, and you know, a little a little bit of spreadsheet goes a long way there. Yeah, it, was, it took me a while as I got started, but getting over your um, fright of spreadsheets is. Yeah, it's I, quite a good thing I, to put on your your learning roadmap. <laughs> so that's what you're looking to. Yeah. There are many reasons why spreadsheets and, and CSV files can be extremely useful mm -hmm. um, in, in any form of uh, real time project. Yeah. Um, let's move. Uh, Lufinet asked another question. Uh, I thought it was pretty good. Um, advice on what aspects to simplify first when optimizing for lower spec computers for the low, mm -hmm. lower graphical settings without making the game look terrible. Yeah. So the first thing that you can do there are there are a lot of there are a lot of knobs that can get turned under engine scalability settings. Um, there are a lot of knobs that can get turned with material quality. So we can very briefly touch on that. Um, so if you have a quality switch, so this lets you determine how your material will work at different material quality levels, which are set in your engine scalability settings. Excuse me. And so you might say, 
you know, at the epic level, I'm going to use this whole big graph. But maybe at the low level, I instead of doing a full uh, a full box blur on all nine pixels, I might only do it on four pixels, or I might only do it on two pixels, or something like that. Um, there are there are a lot of ways to to basically build content for your high end and your low end all in the same place. The other thing that is super super helpful is in your static meshes because again you know you can only push so many polygon so much data through lower spec gpus or or um different hardware so you might need to set your minimum lod so this little plus icon over here adds an override for a platform or it adds an override for a uh, uh for a platform group or a quality level or something like that so i might say you know, because I'm going to make this a mobile game and a console game and a desktop game. On mobile, I'm going to use LOD2. That's going to be my new LOD0. Um, and that reduces the number of polygons that, that the mobile renderer is going to have to have to parse without making any additional changes to your assets or without making any additional changes to what your game looks like on PC. Uh, and that is uh, a whole extra talk about about how you can build a really really high quality visuals and then with some settings without having to to make you know have like a sub a full sub level that is like low or high uh, you can also set the detail mode for all of your meshes right so i can say hey this one's only going to show up in high but this one's going to show up in low right there's so many different things you can do without having to have like completely separate assets, which I, I really, really love. Let's move on. Um, mm -hmm. I have a few more good ones here. Cool. Uh, Lissara Lee asked another question. Can you set different shadow distances, et cetera, for different use cases? For example, if a player is flying a plane, can you set a higher value than when the player is on the ground? So what I would do, if I know that those are dynamic, um, and I knew, you know, if I knew that I was flying, I might have a blueprint that changes that uh, when I get into a plane, for example, or or when I pass a certain altitude, I might have a blueprint that goes through and changes that because those are those are all dynamic settings, especially if you you know directional. Can I not spell? Or did someone rename it? In the wrong level, lighting. Oh, this happened to me once before. I have to re. I have to reload the level. Um, but yeah, so all the all the settings on directional lights. Hey, maybe you, if, if you know when a player is going to be getting into those situations, you can set up uh, functionality to apply those those different settings. Oh, no, don't do that. Reload the map. That's it. Ah, uh, ah, there it is. There's it needed there it to is. happen one last time. Oh, yeah, one last time. Thankfully, you have a really nice background on your PC. I know. How beautiful is this? Um, the Digital Cowboy asked, when it comes to LODs, is there a benefit to not using LOD0 and LOD1 if the asset has very high poly counts, such as the Megas, uh, Megascans assets? Uh, and then he had another, added another little question, to mainly help cut down on project size. Ah, project size is critical. So I think, it, you know, if I'm worried about how much room, you know, especially in, in these times or for a distributed team or something like that, where you have, you know, my household internet might not be the best. And I don't want to have to subject my, uh, my contractors or my friends that are working on this project to, um, and I don't want to have to subject them to downloading 20 gigabytes or 30 gigabytes. That kind of, you need to think about that at the asset level. Like maybe, you know, I think, uh, Jacob, correct me if I'm wrong. In Quixel Bridge, you can set which LODs you export. Um, 
you can currently set what base LOD you export. And okay. depending on whether or not uh, in the live link you chose that you want to actually have an LOD setup, then it will automatically pull in all subsequent LODs. Mm -hmm. um, this behavior might change to something that is even more user-friendly. Um, we're currently working on that to, to make this as pleasant as possible. Excellent. Um, so huge user improvements um, are, are being worked on. And especially with the LODs, it's, it's a bit tricky because Unreal Engine does a fantastic job at still making use of the lot zero normal map on completely different topology um, without mm -hmm. breaking uh, normals. Um, mm. And so that's something uh, that we really want to leverage because it's unique to Unreal Engine. Yeah. So that, you know, it, as you're, as you're going through and you're like, well, if I, if I know the, the platform targets that I'm working with, you know, I know that it can't handle 50 million triangles or even 5 million triangles. Um, then if I'm, if I know that I'm never going to use them, then I will just not import them. Um, you may have a situation where you want like your, so maybe you have uh, uh, a an asset that the character holds in the first person, and you also want to have without changing anything the asset on the ground. Maybe you set the screen size for that asset for LOD zero to be really really high, and and then like as soon as it gets out of the player's hand, it pops over to LOD one. I've seen this this done before, um, so that you you know if you if you're not rendering out the little crevices on your pickaxe. Or something like that and all the little wood grain as soon as it gets out of your hand it it switches over to that led um that's always something to consider but yeah like like i said if you if you know that you are not going to use all of the all of that data i wouldn't import it yeah bob's not your uncle asked how many layers are recommended for painting layers with your landscape material and in turn can all of those have different foliage grass types without impacting performance too much Ooh, it depends. I didn't um, say they were going to be easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean these are all good questions, um, and and certainly everybody everybody wants wants guidance. And you know it depends on how much of your landscape is you're gonna, are you going to be seeing what uh, platforms are you targeting because at a certain point you know the number of uh, the number of layers will increase the number of textures, and then you have to use shared texture samplers, but maybe the platform you're targeting doesn't have shared texture samplers. Um, so like, I think for mobile, um, that may be an issue. So it depends. The, the other thing to keep in mind is that and I'll jump into shift two. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, this will increase the number of materials that you have to compile. Uh, because the more layers you have per component, the more like sub permutations of the material that it'll, that it'll create. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven layers on this one right now. And those are all just running through a layer height blend. And again, you'll get to see how all of this plays out um, when, when we release this. The other thing I've added are two non-weight blended layers for snow and, and water. Um, and the other thing I've added, if it'll show up, is a foliage mask which is not weight blended. So you can paint out foliage in certain areas. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend more than like 16. That, that'd be huge. Um, I, this is kind of where we wanted to stop it. But all of this is going into um, a runtime virtual texture, which greatly simplifies the the draw cost of the landscape for us in our situation um, but yeah like the the more the more permutations you have the more draw calls it is the more draw calls it is the more expensive it's going to be um and so on and so forth so that's that's something to keep in mind i the trouble is once we start getting into that once we start getting into the like how many Layers can I have? What texture size? You know, what are my poly budgets? These are all again. There are certain like hard, not hard limitations, but but reasonable limitations. And some of that is stuff that I've 
I developed an instinct for. Like I might look at something and say, it feels a little high. Um, but that's because I've been doing this for a really, really long time. And it's just a, a again, a statement of your values of your, of your, your chosen art direction, what, uh, what compromises you want to make. And if you say, you know, I want, and maybe, maybe you have a situation where, you know, you want a bunch of different layers and maybe you know that like four of those layers are only going to be on this landscape over here. And four of those layers are going to be on this landscape over here. And maybe you just have two different landscapes with two different materials. And that's maybe okay too. It's all, it's all something to think about. If you leave with anything today, folks, it's, it's all something to think about. It all, it all, you know, it depends and it will ultimately, it, some, a lot of this is going to be, a lot of this is going to be up to you. I wish, sometimes I wish there were hard limits where I could just say, no, you cannot have more than this many, but you know, some of those limits are, are hard coded and they're very, very high and they're probably much higher than most people are ever going to need. Squee Times asked a question earlier, and I thought we could um, iterate on this a little bit further because there's actually um, quite a bit. If, if you all still have some time, continue questions. Oh, yeah, I have a little bit more time, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah I was thinking another 15 Great. minutes, and then I think, think, think we're calling it. Um, so it was when you were showing off the uh, thatched um, house, and the question was, why are the houses separated into a level by themselves? Is that a common practice or just for performance? And so could you iterate a little bit about sort of the workflow benefits as well as some of the potential performance benefits when it comes to using sublevels? So I'll let uh, Jacob take the like construction. Yeah. And then you take over when we get into performance. Um, so when it comes to constructing these, we're constructing them out of modular pieces uh, from the Megaskins library and custom created assets to, to sort of feel, uh, make them feel a bit more run down and uh, fantasy-esque. Um, so the problem with that, if I'd assemble all of that in my main level, um, is that I'd possibly create a lot of dirty files and have a super cluttered world outliner. By keeping them in a separate level, I have one place for each and every house that is specific to that construction process so if I want to change a house, I don't need to worry about anything else. I just need to go in there, know what house I'm working on, and can change everything without affecting my main level. I can change lighting scenarios, switch from HDRIs to uh, procedural sky systems, um, play around with my fog, really dig into my post-process settings to see when certain materials or effects break, um, and just really sort of break the construction level without actually breaking my main level. Now, the cool thing uh, that we've done on this project um, is that we've actually created a template actor system. Um, what that means is that I essentially propagate all of the mesh data that I have in my construction level to a template actor, and I can just spawn that template actor in my main level, and it will automatically place all the instant meshes, um, uh, the, the static meshes in the correct order um, mm -hmm. and uh, with the correct translates in my level, which means now I have one actor that I can start moving around containing all of the different static meshes, um, and especially with still needing or still possibly changing these things, it's good to be able to communicate back and forth. So now mm -hmm. I can, in my main level, for example, change the placement of certain elements and propagate that back to my construction level. Um, mm -hmm. And this is just a really good workflow especially when you start having sub assemblies in engine to keep things clean because nobody wants to go in the main level especially other artists working on the same project and dig through hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of actors that just belong to the construction of houses that are completely irrelevant for the actual gameplay level if that mm. makes sense now performance wise meta will be able to talk yeah about it. so so from a performance standpoint one of the benefits of having uh different chunks broken up into sub levels obviously like you know maybe if i okay and our call distance volume is turned back on so we're losing all the trees um very aggressive call distances so maybe uh you know i know that at a certain distance i don't need to uh i don't need the inside of this house maybe we can go into all of our houses 
And that's where we can start worrying about um, streaming in all of these sublevels and say, you know, I'm only going to stream in the inside of this house once you're, you know, maybe depending on how long it takes, um, you know, a thousand units away, two thousand units away. Um, the other benefit is H lots, uh, which is this this is an, this is another live stream altogether. Um, but the ba the like the super 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 simplest idea I can communicate to you is like group a bunch of assets, make an LOD for them, make, making an LOD of the LODs. So like I know that when I'm super super far away, maybe I'll set this up for this project too. Uh, just get get all the all the perf working is maybe when I get super super far away, we'll have H lots for all of these, so that now you know this house is its own single draw call single mesh baked down into a 2048 yeah it'll it'll cost us a little bit of memory and we'll we'll plan for that um but then this thing is it because it's in its own sub level we don't stream it in until we get much closer and then the h lod for it will will kind of will persist in a in a different place um yeah and and so so having everything broken up into sub levels kind of supports that workflow and I really, I really hope that uh, when we release this project, I will have an example of how that works because I think it's it's really, really useful to do for a lot of people in a lot of situations. One quick note, just for sort of differentiation purposes, yeah. we have houses in sub levels that are actually grouped under the persistent level, so you can unload and load these. Mm -hmm. um, but the actual construction levels are not the sub levels of the persistent level; they're a completely separate map. Uh, which is in no way directly affiliated to the persistent level we're working in as our game map, just mm -hmm. to, to make that clear. Yeah. The one last thing I wanted to add, which is probably the first reason why I got into sublevels is because it makes collaboration when you, and you should yes. have your project yes. on source control, version control, you know, whichever yes. term you prefer, <laughs> because it allows you to, so if you're unfamiliar with version control, go check out the stream I did with Aaron. Great stuff there. It's in the playlist. Um, it's that, say if uh, Jacob wanted to go in and, you know, play around with little thatch pieces on a house and we this is all everything in just one persistent level, he needs to check out that level. And what checking out means is that you, he basically locks that file and no one can actually submit changes to it while he has it checked out. Mm -hmm. If that's your workflow, you're going to have to talk to each other. Someone is going to overwrite and, and clobber changes, which means that you're both going to push two separate versions of the same file to the repo. And it's going to go, hey, you have to pick one of these. Um, and so sublevels allows, you know, the typ typical setup would be like, you know, environment art, maybe one for audio, maybe one for gameplay, you know, purposes and whatnot. And that allows the team to, at the same time, work together um, on separate sort of little subsections of the level. And it just Dis makes, yeah. And even if you're not, um, even if you're not, say you're a solo dev on this project, it still makes sense because it allows you to track down problems much easier. If you break something mm -hmm. and it only, or if you, you know, you made a change, you can see exactly, oh, it was in this sub level. And instead of you going around looking, you know, take a profile GPU capture here, profile GPU capture there, you know that it was just this one sub level. So a lot of good reasons to do that. Also, just general organization, um, it helps out a lot. Right. I mean, you, you can see in there actually that we have a basic atmospherics folder, audio, mm -hmm. uh, we have foliage volumes, we have the forge and the different houses as our separate sublevels, the gameplay and the performance and the lighting uh, as separate sublevels. Um, and the same goes for two basic sublevels that we call uh, Geometry Victor and Geometry Jacob, uh, <laughs> which is simply Victor Roman is the uh, second. Uh, artist working on this project um, mm -hmm. or the second environment artist. Um, and we want to make sure that we are able to A, work on separate houses and start to move them around if necessary and B, do different dressing passes simultaneously in the same persistent level. Um, and this this can get hairy and we're only two people. So uh, with sub levels, you just really make sure that the changes go where you want them to go and where you can actually collaboratively um, stream that back, uh, back into the main, uh, yeah. main content stream. That's, that's critical. Yeah. I remember my, my senior thesis in college, which was an Unreal 3 cinematic project, 
we didn't have source control and I was working with a partner and our version of source control, we had a shared directory and our version of source control was, hey, Matt, I'm working in this level. Please don't touch it. Just over the shoulder. And that was it. Um, yeah. we've, we've come a long way, um, especially with, you know, it's easier to get access to things like Git. It's easier to get access to uh, things like Perforce. Um, I remember at one point I set up my own Perforce server on my own computer uh, just because I love source control that much. Um, and the other thing to think about too is like source control also allows you to do backups. Um, and so, you know, the, the thing I was showing in our perf report, those were the different change lists. And what, what knowing these different change lists gives me is I can track down the specific change or I know the range of changes in which a change could have occurred that affected performance. So if you are running your perf tests you know, on every change list or every 10 change lists or something like that, that'll help you narrow things down. And it gives you a lot of backup because God forbid, you know, uh, Victor and I were talking about things are super windy around here. Uh, the power might go out. If the power goes out while your hard drive is in the middle of a read-write operation, it may corrupt your file. If you corrupt a file and you do not have a backup, that data is gone. The, like the, the, the bits for that file are completely blown away. I've seen it happen a couple of times and it's soul crushing. Um, it is painful. Because there's no recovering from that. Yeah. And unless you have backups in source control and then you're fine. You just, okay, you know, I lost a day's worth of work versus a month's worth of work. Power supplies are not eternal, folks. Yeah, I have two. And I'm like, oh boy, I have 10 minutes. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh God. The Digital Cowboy asked another question. <clears throat> um, foliage status instance has no collision. Do merge meshes like this, and he was referring to when you were um, playing around with the merge actor tool, <laughs> do merge meshes like this retain their collision after merging? So if... If we have a just a merged static mesh actor, we can go take a look at that. Um, I don't actually know if those had collision on them, but of course, if you if you merge it like so, oh, don't crash. Um, if you merge it like so, you can set up your own collision for this one, um, just like you would any other static mesh. Um, you don't because this is not an imported asset. Uh, you may not have the ability to do like the full custom collision shape, UCX kind of thing. Um, instance static mesh components, I don't actually know the answer to that question, and I will answer that on the forums. We're getting potato quality from you right now, Matt. Um, oh, no. But good thing we're at the end of this, almost at the <laughs> end of the stream, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've used up all of my internets for the day. <laughs> um, Menji Sagami asks, do you have any experience with imposter baker for optimizing levels? Ah, I do enjoy the imposter baker. Um, I have a little bit of, of, of experience with it, and I find it to be a really useful tool for optimizing specifically, very specifically, like foliage assets. Um, because what, it, what it'll do is grab, um, it'll do basically two things. It'll give you like the card, baked card representation of it, and it'll give you a single uh, frame representation of it that kind of interpolates which subframe it looks at based on your camera angle. The imposter baker is super, 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 super useful. And if you have, um, if you know that you're going to have a bunch of trees that are off in the distance, right? I don't need to render all of these. Oh Lord. I don't need to render all of the triangles for this tree if at this distance, because it, it all, everything kind of flattens out at a distance. That's just how perspective works. Um, maybe I only need this to be a a card, and that card is just looking looking up at a texture to figure out what um, to figure out what to draw instead of focusing on all of the individual triangles or all of the all of the different parts of this tree. The caveat is that it won't be an animated tree, but, but the the swaying of this tree at a certain distance is not going to be you know that might be a half a pixel left or right, and maybe I don't need to see that. Yeah, I, I like the imposter baker. All right. 
definitely end here. Um, so there are a couple more questions that we, we're not going to have time to answer. I will make sure I submit all of these to Matt and, and Jacob in case there's a couple of them that they thought were good and they want to provide an answer for. Um, let's yep. see. We can have Sam drop the um, uh, link to the forum announcement post. Uh, that's where all the discussions post-stream occur, um, questions, answers in regards to the live stream. So go check that out. Uh, but I do have one last question for you. Um, and I want you both individually to answer this. Uh, what okay. is your favorite spooky game? Oh, man. Ah, <sighs> so I guess I can talk about this a little bit. Uh, I'm going to do extra life again for the first time in like seven years. And, you know, that's the 24 hour gaming charity. And the first time I ever did it, I set a goal. I was like, all right, if I get $500 raised, I am going to play Amnesia Dark Descent starting at midnight, and I will not stop until I finish the game. And by gosh, I did. And it was, I think, the single most terrifying thing I've ever done or played. Oh, boy. Yeah, no, I'm... Like, I'm, I'm not as hardcore. <laughs> I, I, I get scared really easily. Like gory stuff i don't have problems with but i do too that's why it was the 500 hundred dollar goal <laughs> so i usually stay away from from these types of games and for example i i count the the metro franchise into my list of super scary <laughs> games that i've played um but i think the the definite top pick would be alien isolation oh. uh, because that ai is way too smart for my liking and <laughs> scaring the crap out of me and hunting me through levels it is mm -mm. <laughs> mm -hmm. that was that was a game i had to play with the lights on yeah i with my friends near me like <laughs> <laughs> yes mm -hmm. <laughs> i think when i did that amnesia live stream i had a friend that was like my 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 support friend my buddy pat he was just there he's yeah. like is everything okay Do you know it's, it's gonna be fine it's not out. real it can't it's okay. it can't hurt you <laughs> No, but but it is there. There are some some really gnarly, scary games out there. Masterfully uh, horror. Yeah. And more, and more are going to be developed. There is no end to horror, and they're gonna get scarier and scarier. I'm also in the same boat. I really can't deal with it. And since I've been doing yeah. VR for a long time, VR games, is, uh, VR horror oh. games, is just a big no. I, I it, it's and I I have to play them for the game jams. <laughs> um, and. Uh, <laughs> I was I was about to say like if it's if it's only monitor in front of you that's one thing but if you're yeah. actually stuck in this game that's a, that's that's a hard hard. like I I watched some uh, because I don't own a VR set I watched some uh, Half Life Alex footage um, and oh. and and some of these instances I said that I, was, uh, I would I would write about there crap my my pants because that is really scary when you think about not being able to just look away disengage yeah. yeah. I remember having mm -hmm. to explain to someone who, who was testing a, a horror VR game and they asked, like, I, I can't, I can't not see this. And I had to explain that, like, you can close your eyes, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you, you can close your eyes down, yeah. you know, that just what you do in, in real life and you won't see it. But due to audio, like, still feels like you're there, right? Anyway, yeah. um, that's wrapping up for today. Um, thank you so much to Matt and Jacob for coming on, um, providing Anytime. all of their knowledge. Uh, in regards to performance optimization for I mean, environments. Yeah. Kudos to, to Matt for that. I was just the, the counterpart artist that needs some some teaching on performance. Kudos to Jacob for this beautiful environment that that I I get to optimize and work with every day. It's so much fun. Oh, thank you very much. But same goes to uh, to Chris, Alex, and, and Victor and all the yes, of amazing course. dudes and dudettes working on this. This is, uh, this is group project for sure. Yes. And it will eventually be available to all of you for free, um, probably on the marketplace, I would think. Yes, exactly. It will be available in, in, in all its glory. There we go. On the Unreal Engine marketplace sometime in the future. Um, yes, fully finished, packed, optimized um, with all of the goodies from, uh, from the process in there for you to take apart and dig through. 
That's fun. great. Um, if you join us today and you've been here from the start, thank you so much for hanging out. We hope you had a good time. If you are new to Unreal Engine uh, and you're interested in what it might mean to work with Unreal Engine and produce all kinds of amazing things from games to movies to our archivists and simulation, uh, go to unrealengine.com. You can download the launcher for free um, as well as Unreal Engine and you can get started immediately. Um, Unreal Online Learning is a great resource if you're just getting started. There are I don't know the number. There are a lot of courses on how to do various things in Unreal Engine. Everything from getting started into doing deep dives into lighting, VR, you name it. Uh, most of it is there. If not, we also have an amazing community that is producing all kinds of specific niche tutorials um, on YouTube as well. Go ahead and check them out. Also, if you enjoy watching live content on Twitch, there is actually an Unreal Engine tag. And so you can go ahead and filter for Unreal Engine and game development and you'll find some of our amazing uh, community members that are streaming live probably right now on Twitch and we are probably going to try to raid one of them when we're done here. Um, make sure that you let us know how we did today and what you thought of the stream and what you would like to see in the future. Uh, we have a little survey that we drop. If you're watching the stream afterwards, you can also find that in the forum announcement post. Uh, we love your feedback and it's important for us to know what you'd like to see in the future. So go ahead and make sure you fill that out if you have the spare time. Um, even though we are not able to see each other in real life as much as we want to, uh, there are still the virtual community meetups happening around the world. If you are interested in that and you're maybe getting a little bit excited about the potential possibility of getting back into the real world and doing you know, things together, uh, communities.unrealengine.com is your place for these uh, virtual meetup groups. If you can't find a group in your area, there's a nice little button that says become a leader up top right. You can click that, fill out a form, and we will get in touch with you in terms of what it means becoming a meetup group leader. Um, as always, make sure you check out our forums, um, unrealstackers.com, Facebook, Reddit, Twitter, where pretty much everywhere you could want to see us in terms of our, our news, updates, tutorials, and everything else that in the world of Unreal Engine is coming out. Uh, so go ahead and make sure you follow us and um, and yeah, I'm gonna read all of that stuff. Um, I'll also go ahead and if you're checking this out on YouTube, make sure you hit that notification bell to make sure that you see when we produce new content. Every week we are releasing content, tips and tricks, webinars, etc. Uh, our educator streams, which is tomorrow, um, it all goes up on YouTube as well if you prefer that platform or, or if you're unable to catch the streams because we know it's like in the middle of the night in Australia right now uh, to Chris Murphy's demise. Uh, he <laughs> is going to have to come back on the live stream at some point. Um, <laughs> it's going to happen. Thankfully, he has better internet now. Um, mm. So it won't be potato quality throughout. Um, if you are interested in seeing your content as one of our countdown videos at the beginning of the live stream, uh, go ahead and send us th around 30 minutes of development. Fast forward that to five minutes and send us that file to uh, com community at unrealengine.com. Um, keep it completely plain. We will add the countdown. Oh, and also make sure you drop your logo in that email so that we can make sure that we uh, credit uh, the right person who made it. Um, I mentioned this, if you're streaming on Twitch, make sure you use the Unreal Engine tag as well as the game development tag. That's the best way for us to see what you're working on as well as the rest of the community. And uh, yeah, next week, uh, I am actually going to have Wyeth Johnson and John Lindquist on the stream, and they're going to talk about Advanced Niagara Effects. Uh, that forum announcement post is already up on the forum. If you're curious about that or have any questions you would like to ask them prior to the stream, go ahead and make sure you drop those in the thread. And once again, special thanks to Jacob and Matt for coming on the stream today. It's been a pleasure. I'm really glad to have you here. Um, and I hopefully we get to do this again sometimes. And then we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all of you out there. Uh, big thanks to you for sticking around, asking awesome questions and enjoying our content. Hopefully you, you learned something. Um, if, if not, I'll go and check the YouTube video again and you know try to see what the console commands that uh, Matt typed in. Uh, there is a lazy dog sheet. I don't know if that's the proper English term, but we call it a, a, a lazy dog sheet in Swedish. I don't really know if that's the English term. Sheet, sheet, sheet. 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 Yeah, so easy to say. Um, yeah. I think there is one out there in terms of these console commands uh, mm -hmm. and what they are. There is a slew of them. Um, I also think I, I read a, a tutorial. And then, man, there's so much content that I've seen that's in my head and I realized like, I don't have links to half of these. So hopefully your Google Foo is better than mine. Um, which leads me to the point of our transcript. All of our live streams are actually transcribed, um, which means that later on YouTube, about a week roughly after it's been uploaded, we also upload uh, accurate captions for the stream. And so if there were any terms, um, any terminology or something that you had a 
difficult time hearing what we said, uh, you can either turn on captions on YouTube or just go ahead and download that entire transcription file. What's really cool about that is that if you watch the live stream, you remember, hey, they were talking about you know, um, landscape or foliage or anything else, you can open up that text file, control F, search for the term, and you actually see a timestamp when we were talking about that in the stream, uh, which is a useful way if you want to get a little bit more context about that word that you were looking for. With that said, it's time to go, it's time to say goodbye. Y'all stick around for a little bit. And to you all out there, I hope to see you again next week. Until then, stay safe and have a great time. Learn as much as possible. Um, and yeah, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, y'all. Wonderful Bye, everyone. evening. Thank <laughs> you.